Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to today's special conference co-hosted by Che Institute for Advanced Studies and Brookings Institution commemorating the 70th anniversary of Korea-US alliance. In fact, today's conference is the second of its kind between our two organizations. The first collaboration dates back to 2014 when we held a conference in Washington, D.C. The 2014 conference uh, was broadcasted live by C-SPAN and received widespread attention from policymakers, media, and the public in the United States. I'm very honored to resume this time-honored academic undertakings with the Brookings Institution again here in Seoul. I think we enjoyed too long a hibernation. We are gathered here today uh, to not only uh, revisit the past 70 years of our blood forced alliance, but also to create a blueprint for the next 70 years by looking at challenges and opportunities that lie ahead of, uh, for our alliance. The most pressing issue for Korea and the alliance remains North Korea's relentless provocations. Kim Jong-un met with uh, Vladimir uh, uh, Putin at Russian Space Center yesterday, which proves North Korea's intention to accelerate its provocation on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. During their meeting, the Kim Jong-un offered Putin his country's full and unconditional support for what he called Russia's sacred fight. It was reported that Kim Jong-un had showed great interest in rocket engineering and space technologies. In 2012, North Korea revised its constitution, and in 2022, it dared to legalize its nuclear preemptive strike against South Korea. Such unprecedented threats that jeopardizes Korea's supreme interest provide the necessary and sufficient legal requirement on the Article 10 of the MPT for the Republic of Korea to legally withdraw from the MPT. In this regard, I would like to bring to your attention the result of Che Institute public opinion survey conducted last year. According to the Che Institute the Gallup Korea poll result, 76% of Korean supported indigenous development of South Korea's nuclear weapons. This shocking uh, result shows the serious level of anxiety of Korean people toward North Korea's rapidly advancing nuclear capabilities. This is comparable to the 1961 dilemma between President de Gaulle and President Kennedy who hesitated to commit to trading New York for Paris in case of Soviet Union's nuclear attack. On top of that, President Trump's statements about withdrawing American troops from the Korean Peninsula loom large with his potential re-election in 2024. In the April Washington Declaration and Camp David outcome document last month, President, Yoon's, uh, President Yoon reaffirmed Korea's long-standing commitment to non-proliferation under the MPT. Thanks to the great achievement of the Washington, uh, Washington Summit and Camp David Trilateral Summit, I am certain that the support for indigenous nuclear weapon in Korea will be significantly lowered in this year's Che public opinion poll, which will take place later this year. The Camp David summit also generated a historic momentum to establish a multilateral or hybrid form of security architecture, moving away from the traditional bilateral security arrangement in Northeast Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, as everyone here is aware, Korea has achieved a, a, a meteoric rise in various clusters in cutting edge technologies, especially semiconductors and EV batteries. For example, 
SK Hynix recently developed the latest fifth generation high band memory chip or uh, HBM3E for AI application and supplied some of these chips to NVIDIA. This takes years of mutual trust and co-development between the private sectors of the United States and Korea. The US and Korea have made a very successful effort to form a united front to secure resilience in the semiconductor and EV battery global supply chains. As part of this effort, the United States invited Korea, Japan, and Taiwan in March 2022 to form a Chief 4 Alliance as part of its action plan to enhance security and resilience of semiconductor supply chain. In terms of action plan, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan introduced the Biden administration's small yard high fence approach to protect foundational technologies. As part of this approach, we expect the United States will reinforce thorough implementation of friend shoring and onshoring. Such policy will generate a new geopolitical and geoeconomic order for a more sustainable and balanced global supply chain. At the same time, I'd like to invite your attention to the following questions. First, how will the U.S. find an appropriate balance between friend shoring uh, and onshoring, especially in semiconductor and EV battery industry? Second, how do we address what Korean private sector and public audience may interpret as seemingly unfair or discriminatory policies of the United States vis-a-vis -vis private sectors of the allies who have sunken investment in China. I hope we could come up with appropriate answers to these questions so that these companies can serve unswervingly as a locomotive in achieving balanced global supply chain in favor of the United States and Korea as well. One of uh, the key commitments of Camp David Trilateral Summit was establishing information sharing and early warning system to prevent negative impact on supply chains if external disruptions lead to serious shortage of semiconductors and batteries. As part of identifying potential external disruptions, I'd like to raise the possibility of China's invasion of Taiwan and its far-reaching ramification on the global semi uh, semiconductor supply chain. As you might well aware, the many high-level U.S. officials have predicted that Chinese invasion of Taiwan would occur between 2027 to 2030s with uh, varying scenarios. China, on the other hand, has categorically denied such possibilities as Premier of China's State Council Li Chiang stressed at the outset of the Boao Forum last March. While I sincerely hope that Chinese invasion of Taiwan remains a purely imaginary scenario, we cannot predict what the future holds for us. As such, today's conference with top-notch experts from U.S. and Korea could not be more timely. Ladies and gentlemen, to celebrate 100th birthday, former Secretary of uh, Henry Kissinger recently had an interview with The Economist. In his interview, the Dr. Kissinger expressed his concern that, I quote, Japan is on the way to become a nuclear power within five years, unquote. I believe his concern was not about Japan's nuclearization per se, but more about nuclear proliferation in Northeast Asia. As a time honored uh, contributor to U.S. commitment to non-proliferation, Korea shares such concern. To first, a better landscape of non-proliferation in Northeast Asia and enhanced security consolidation between U.S. and Korea. I'd like to propose the following three points. First, we highly recommend the creation of a U.S. RK bilateral or U.S. Korea Japan trilateral international consortium for the production of 
supply of enriched uranium below 20% for civil nuclear power plants. From, the, uh, from an industrial perspective, the current enriched uranium market is dominated by Rosatom of Russia with 47% of world market share as of now. With the decline of uh, Uranco of Europe and discontinued U.S. domestic production of enriched uranium, there are growing really serious concerns about Russia's monopolization of the low enriched uranium supply chain. That's why the co-production of enriched uranium by Korea and United States is badly needed in the global market. As part of this effort, the U.S.-Korea Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, or 123 Agreement, needs to be upgraded to the level of U.S.-Japan Nuclear Agreement, especially in terms of uranium enrichment below 20%. Second, Korea and the United States should establish a consortium to co-produce nuclear-powered submarines. The United States Jones Act currently prevents the production of naval ships of submarines outside American soil. This may have led to skyrocketing prices of submarine and naval shipbuilding. By creating this kind of consortium, the two allies could utilize world-class Korean shipbuilding facilities, including a shipbuilding dock, and experienced workforce at a reasonable price. Lastly, Korea and the United States should enhance cooperation on emerging space technologies. Utilizing real-time space surveillance is crucial for detecting major activities of North Korean nuclear facilities, as well as identifying and tracking uh, transporter electro launchers or uh, TELS. In Korea, 44 small military satellites, along with five four to five reconnaissance satellites in low Earth orbit are planned to be launched by 2030. However, this is not enough to deter North Korean nuclear and missile threats in real-time tracking. As such, the Camp David Summit provided a good starting point to vigorously improve trilateral interoperability and integration of space surveillance among U.S., Korea, and Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, I greatly look forward to today's special conference between Brookings Institution and Che Institute that could share light on the uncharted path for the next 70 years of U.S.-Korea alliance. I thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my old friends, uh, new friends, uh, colleagues, uh, distinguished experts, uh, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very delighted to uh, have this wonderful opportunity uh, to speak to an uh, excellent uh, group of scholars and experts. Uh, at the 20s, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, at the 70th anniversary of the uh, ROC US Alliance, our two allies are uh, facing a, a variety of uh, challenges. Uh, for so-called the liberal international order. The liberal international order, as you know, is a system established by the United States along with its uh, allies and friends uh, to redesign uh, international relations uh, immediately after World War II. Key elements uh, including uh, promoting free trade, uh, establishing the role of uh, international financial institutions, uh, such as IMF and World Bank, and fostering uh, multilateral cooperation uh, centered on the United Nations. United States has uh, maintained uh, this order based on his uh, overwhelming uh, military power uh, and liberal ideology. In particular, uh, international order during the Cold War was a rule-based order. There were rules to respect the sovereignty of individual states uh, prohibit the uh, referation of WMD and strive to uh, promote uh, human rights. This allowed the liberal camp uh, to gain a political, economic, and moral superiority uh, over the communist camp. 
In addition, uh, the end of the Cold War opened the door for the liberal international order to uh, expand into the former uh, communist bloc. However, as the relative weakness uh, of the United States military and economic power had been revealed uh, during the Iraq and Afghan wars and the US-led financial crisis, the behavior of other uh, major powers began to change. Countries that would challenge the liberal international order or attempt to revise it began to threaten the existing order. Someone called this the return of geopolitics. In addition, while with uh, the inauguration of uh, President uh, Donald Trump in January uh, 2017, challenges to the liberal international order also surfaced within the United States. The election of President Trump was due to his reading the minds of white middle class and workers believing that it makes no sense for the United States to act as a solver or a fixer uh, for what is happening outside the country when order, peace, and prosperity are collapsing within the United States. In this sense, it is uncertain if the liberal international order will endure in the face of challenges posed inside and outside the United States. I believe whether the liberal international order will continue depends on the strategy and the will of the United States. As uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski emphatically pointed out right after the end of the Cold War, the U.S. grand strategy uh, should focus on preventing the key Eurasian countries like China, Russia, India, Iran, and Turkey uh, from creating an uh, anti-U.S. condominium. But the geopolitical situation is not unfolding as President Key advised. Moreover, since the United States is reluctant to intervene in international affairs, the gap between the U.S. power in uh, possession and uh, power in use is increasing then the global trust in the liberal international order will decline sharply. Of course, no other country, uh, including even China, has uh, yet to propose a new order that can replace the liberal international order. But the problem is that if a neo-isolationist uh, and or mercantilist candidate uh, becomes the next president of the United States, the U.S. leadership to actively maintain the liberal international order will be seriously weakened. Against this backdrop, it is necessary to understand how the Iraq-U.S. alliance related to the U.S.-Chinese strategic competition. As no, the U.S.-China uh, chip war or trade dispute is not simple dispute but a strategic competition between the United States, which has exercised military and economic hegemony on the one hand, and China, which is contesting it on the other. U.S.-China strategic competition could even last until 2050. It is because many experts argue that it ha takes one generation, at least, uh, for the winner and the loser to be clearly determined in the core fields of the fourth industrial revolution, such as uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, quantum computing, robotics, etc. So from the perspective of South Korea, a U.S.-China strategic competition is a rivalry on who will set the standard for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, that is why we have come across the issue of expanding the rock us alliance beyond the military uh, dimension uh, to economic and technological aspects. In other words, the question is whether the rock us alliance can become a comprehensive strategic alliance as jointly envisioned by President George W. Bush and President Lee Myung Bak in 2008. In this vein, the rock us alliance is facing two critical tasks. The first task is to strengthen uh, nuclear extended deterrence to counter the heightening North Korean nuclear threat as Pyongyang pursues diversification and sophistication of nuclear weapons uh, and ICBMs. I believe 
the Putin and Kim Jong Un summit yesterday was an inflection point where North Korea's nuclear and missile capability would become more threatening uh, to the region as well as to the globe. The second task is for the United States to provide South Korea with what I call economic extended deterrence, if I may, against the third party's uh, economic coercion, as in uh, 2016 when Beijing retaliated against South Korea for the US ROK uh, joint decision deployed DAD system that aims to neutralize uh, North Korea's missile attack on uh, USFK and ROK forces. Regarding the first task of uh, dealing with the North Korean nuclear threat, it will be handled by the ROK US NCG, a nuclear consultative group established in uh, July this year. Now both Seoul and Washington are set on systematically enhancing existing extended deterrent measures and developing detailed operational plans. NCG aims to uh, strengthen uh, the operation uh, of ROK US alliances extended deterrence uh, by focusing on intelligence sharing, command and control coordination, and joint planning and execution of nuclear operations. Most importantly, it is notable that a high-level standing consultative body for discussing nuclear strategy and planning nuclear operations was established uh, for the first time by our two allies. Another task of coping with economic coercion can be handled by ESD, Economic Security Dialogue, between Seoul and Washington, even if it is premature to tell whether ESD is systematically equipped for and can execute economic deterrent measures. The United States and South Korea need to put <coughs> excuse me, a strong economic extended deterrence mechanism in place. Economic extended deterrence uh, should focus on punishing the coercer with an anti-coercion instrument by building a coercion denier coalition and by strengthening supply chain resilience. Most of all, not many countries have the economic power and the scale to use negative inducement against others' economic coercion. Realistically, the United States may be the only country possessing uh, this kind of a policy option. Second, the United States should build an uh, international network of uh, coercion denier coalition, including uh, G7 members, because US alone is not quite sufficient. Third, United States should help its allies to build a supply chain of resilience. The trilateral summit in August uh, Camp David also noted the development of partnership for resilient and inclusive supply chain enhancement to prepare for confronting and overcoming uh, economic coercion. In conclusion, adapting to the changing uh, security uh, environment, uh, South Korea and the United States uh, should strengthen uh, nuclear extended deterrence through the rapid opera, uh, uh, operationalization of NCG and they should develop economic extended deterrence through the solid institutionalization of ESD, Economic Security Dialogue. Combining the two, we will be witnessing the transformation of extended deterrence into what I call comprehensive extended deterrence that is required for the ROK-US alliance to expand to the region and the globe. If ROK-US uh, comprehensive extended deterrence is well established, it can be extended to include uh, Japan and other like-minded countries, which I believe will contribute to peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. Before then, uh, we need to focus on uh, how to deter uh, nuclear armed North Korea while sophisticating our cooperation in the non-traditional security areas of the region. Abraham Lincoln said, quote, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe, end quote. 
In this vein, we need to prepare for the future by sharpening our alliance and solidarity rather than making too many axes. I believe this is the way we can maintain a rule-based international order and sustain it to the extent that the revisionist forces may not threaten that order. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the opening session. Uh, the U.S. Rock Alliance at 70 from Blood Alliance to Batteries, Chips and Technology. My name is Sun Jie, Ambassador for Cultural Cooperation for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and an invited professor at Iwa Women's University. I will be taking you through this first session. This panel takes the topic of 70 years of Korea-U.S. alliance uh, and its evolution over the past seven decades. It is an alliance that started with the Korean War and mostly centered around the security areas. Now this concept and the boundaries of security have expanded from the conventional military strike capacities to the development of weapons of mass destruction to economic security and also and now to ensuring the preservation of critical state-of-the-art technologies and securing safe and stable supply chains. In this panel, we will be exploring the opportunities and challenges that face the U.S.-Korea alliance as we move um, beyond the 70 years. Um, we will start our panel with a presentation from Dr. Yu, who will put the U.S.-Korea alliance um, over the for the past 70 years and in the future in perspective. So, um, Dr. Yeo. Good morning. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, for many times, I've always been on the other side of uh, the internet looking into the space, so it's wonderful to be here in person. I'd like to thank Ambassador Park for uh, resuming this Brookings Che uh, a dialogue that hasn't taken place since 2014. As you mentioned, it has been too long, so I look forward to renewing that relationship again. Um, so my remarks try to set a, a bit of a frame around the 70th anniversary of the U.S.-South Korea alliance. As we all know, it was born in the aftermath of great conflict and upheaval following the Korean War and the early years of the Cold War. And under those pressing conditions, the U.S. and South Korea signed a mutual defense treaty on October 1st, 1953 to defend South Korea and to deter North Korea from launching another invasion. By those standards, the alliance and the 1953 mutual defense treaty, which it stands on, has been a success. It's one of the longest, uh, the U.S. Rock Alliance is one of the longest, most successful alliances in modern history. Uh, but the alliance at 70, today is not the alliance of our fathers or our grandfathers' generation. I mean, Ambassador Park was talking about space cooperation or nuclear submarines and certainly not anything we would have imagined uh, at the time of the Mutual Defense Treaty signing. So in my brief remarks, I offer three points. First, the alliance is a dynamic and robust institution. Second, the U.S. Rock Alliance was always designed for a broader purpose beyond the Korean Peninsula. And third, the bilateral alliance framework is less adequate for addressing economic security issues and will require parallel dialogues at the multilateral level. I'll conclude my remarks with uh, what I think we should watch for in the next 70 years. So on my first point, uh, the alliance is a dynamic institution. Uh, when you think about the alliance, it's uh, often synonymous with U.S. force presence, extended nuclear deterrence, joint military exercises, and other traditional security measures. That's the legacy of the Korean War and the Mutual Defense Treaty. But like any long-term relationship, the alliance must continue to adapt. And South Korea's rapid economic growth and rising capabilities have required reconfiguration and recalibration to the alliance over the seven decades. The process of South Korean democratization in the 80s and the end of the Cold War resulted in significant growing pains for the U.S. Rock Alliance. 
However, the alliance transformation process which ensued in the 2000s put the U.S.-South Korea alliance on a more equal and stronger footing. It also helped expand the scope of the alliance to go well beyond defense and traditional security issues. So as we all know today, we're talking about economics and trade, global health and pandemics, climate change, human rights, democracy, counterproliferation, cybersecurity, science and technology cooperation, supply chains, and so forth. So again, uh, we have adapted this alliance over time across uh, the last 70 years. Now, my second point is that the U.S. ROC Alliance itself was designed for a broader purpose beyond the defense and security of the Korean Peninsula, even though the dominant history and narrative of the alliance has focused on that point, the defense and security of the Korean Peninsula. So recently, I reread the text of the Mutual Defense Treaty, and there's a preamble, and it mentions Pacific area three times. So uh, you know, it comes up when it states, strengthen the fabric of peace in the Pacific area. area. There's a, uh, another clause that says, comprehensive and effective system of regional security in the Pacific area. And there's one other time where it mentions Pacific area, all in the preamble. So from this mutual defense treaty, it's clear that US-South Korea alliance was designed as part of a broader system to deter and defend against communist expansion and aggression in the region. Now, I was struck by uh, this, uh, this phrase, Pacific area, because that's today what the alliance is doing. Now, again, we know that the, the primary function of the alliance was to deter and defend against a North Korea invasion. But it's interesting to think back that they would include uh, Pacific area in terms of the purpose uh, of the alliance, the scope of the alliance. So despite, what's, uh, despite what was in that original mutual defense treaty, the function of the alliance was limited in part because of South Korea's own capa limited capabilities, but that has changed with, with the growth of South Korea economically um, in terms of its de defense expenditures. There's a lot more that South Korea can do these days. And Washington's approach has also changed and shifted over time, especially from the post-Cold War period. The US gradually de-emphasized the hub and spokes analogy to describe its bilateral alliance and instead began describing the regional security architecture as a principled security network. That was the term that uh, the late Defense Secretary uh, Ashton Carter used. And now what the Biden administration refers to this regional architecture is a lattice work of strong and mutually reinforcing coalition. So that's a very different analogy from uh, the hub and spokes. So this has allowed for greater purpose and flexibility in the alliance, and that this idea of overlapping security networks also allows for convergence in the Yun and Biden government's respective strategies towards the Indo-Pacific that enables the two countries to more readily cooperate on pressing regional issues, such as supply chains, economic security, and I think the next 70 years of the alliance will not be characterized as a spoke in a wheel, but as a node in a, in a layered web of institutions. And my last and third point is about the bilateral alliance framework and how I think it's less well suited for dealing with newer economic security issues. We know that COVID-19 and the Ukraine war illustrate the degree of interdependence and potential disruption created by supply chains relevant to critical and emerging technologies. So there's no turning back from economic security issues. U.S.-China competition also ensures that such issues will remain re relevant for the long term. However, economic security and supply chain coordination remains contingent on a variety of geopolitical, economic, and domestic political factors, which cannot be addressed as easily within the confines of a bilateral alliance. Factors such as the direction of U.S.-China competition, shifts in global business and consumer trends, technology change, and domestic industrial policy will affect other US allies and regional partners and therefore require broader regional coordination. So I think the next 70 years of the alliance will need to include new dialogues and mechanisms to address ongoing economic security issues, but these bilateral mechanisms will also likely be shaped by multilateral institutional channels. Um, right now we have the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework there's also the US, Japan, Korea trilateral cooperation, and also mega trade deals like RCEP and CPTPP, which it doesn't look like the US is going to uh, join these anytime soon, but they're still going to shape the conversations around uh, uh, trade and economic security issues. So to conclude, 
we're entering the next 70 years of the alliance from a position of strength. But it doesn't, but I don't think we can just sit back and celebrate. Uh, in, the, in the short term, I think domestic politics always lurks as a spoiler, where we know that things can sour very quickly. I mean, the U.S., there's con I mean, we're following the, the 2024 elections, and you know, but I will just say it, but if Trump is, uh, is elected, we know he doesn't like spending. So what's that mean for things like the nuclear consultative group or the deployment of strategic assets? Because those things, those things cost money. Um, you know, what's it mean for things like trade and market, market access? And also on the South Korea side, you know, President Yoon, if his approval ratings are, uh, you know, continue to remain relatively low, or if there's domestic weaknesses, what's that mean for uh, issues like Korea-Japan relations? Um, so so uh, domestic politics always looks in the background as a spoiler. And then in the long term, I think a lot will depend on what happens with North Korea threats. The lines. If the threat of North Korea, you know, if and when it's reduced, um, that'll lead to questions about U.S. force presence. Um, but at the same time, if North Korea threats are reduced, we're going to think more about the alliance from the perspective of the region of the Indo-Pacific. And thankfully, that's something that uh, the two current leaders have already begun to do, to think about the alliance from that broader regional perspective. Um, but I can definitely foresee in the next 70 years that it won't just be about the U.S. Rock Alliance, but it'll be about the U.S. Rock Alliance and how it fits within uh, the larger regional architecture. Um, th so thank you again, and I look forward to the Q&A later. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and particular thanks to Ambassador Park for having invited me along to this uh, august occasion. Um, I want to talk a little here about the, the threat from North Korea. The threat from anywhere is usually defined as capability plus intent. Uh, there's been quite a lot written about the capability of North Korea, uh, particularly given its advances over the last several years. Uh, less has been written about the intent. I believe this threat is, is underweighted, misunderstood, and is extremely serious. Let me talk a little first, though, about capability. We've all been following with, with growing dismay uh, the advances in North Korean weaponry. Uh, I, the, the situation is extremely complex, but perhaps I could pick out three high points or low points, depending on how you look at things. Uh, first, the, the Hwasong 18 ICBM, uh, first tested in April, most recently launched on the 12th of July this year. Uh, a significant advance in the capability of North Korea to deliver nuclear warheads at long distances, almost certainly capable of reaching uh, significant areas of the United States, solid fueled, so more difficult to knock out on the launch pad, um, and which seems to contain some elements at least of Russian technology. The experts disagree on how much Russian help uh, or stolen Russian plans, who knows, uh, was involved in this. Uh, whatever way you look at it, uh, the, uh, the Hwasong 18 is a significant threat escalation. Second, the Hwasal cruise missile last tested on 2 September, so quite recently, uh, a, an apparently quite efficient cruise missile with some resemblance to the United States Tomahawk missile, capable of hitting uh, non-strategic targets at uh, significant ranges, uh, filling a previously existing gap in North Korea's capability. And perhaps most startling, uh, the Simpo class C submarine, uh, which uh, Kim Jong-un very proudly uh, unveiled on 8 September. Uh, the details are, of course, classified by the North Koreans, but it seems to have 10 launch tubes, uh, which would probably put it within, uh, within range uh, of the United States. Uh, and clearly, if you can sail a submarine uh, close to the U.S. coast, uh, you bypass a lot of the U.S. anti-missile defenses. You can simply lob uh, short-range missiles uh, from your submarine, uh, defeating places like Thad. Uh, in the background, we've had 
two failed satellite launches. A third is promised, uh, perhaps this time with Russian assistance after Kim and Putin's meeting yesterday, uh, where, as you'll recall, Putin specifically talked about assisting the, uh, the space program, as he rather uh, coyly called uh, this attempt to launch a military spy satellite. All these threats, indeed, are exacerbated by a warming relationship between uh, North Korea and Russia. It's not clear how far Russia is prepared to transfer military technology, but any transfer is clearly bad news for the ROK and its many friends and allies. Okay, so North Korea has spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort in uh, the extensive development of threat capability. Why? What is its intent? Uh, the official narrative is deterrence, that it feels the need to defend itself against a threatening United States, a threatening uh, puppet state here in South Korea. Uh, this is doubtless partly posturing, uh, but many conversations with North Korean officials convinced me that there is at least a core of truth to this, that the paranoia is much more real than we tend to assume. Uh, the North Korean elite is a small, closed group. Groupthink takes hold very quickly, and they can talk themselves into all kinds of neuroses much faster than you would like. I want to say, by way of opening to that, there's a widespread belief that North Korea will threaten, cajole, test missiles, but would never actually use a nuclear weapon. Ladies and gentlemen, this belief is extremely dangerous. We are dealing with an unstable decision-making process and with a leadership that is quite capable of convincing itself of the strangest things. Uh, the deterrence offered by uh, the US strategic counter threat that effectively, if North Korea ever did use a nuclear weapon, that the response from the United States would be immediate and devastating, depends on Kim Jong-un and those closest to him believing that the United States would actually do this. We have no assurance that this is the case. And the North Korean elite is quite capable of convincing itself that it has cowed the, uh, the United States into submission that no one would dare to take on the might of North Korean uh, nuclear arms and its huge army. Remember also that in North Korea, uh, telling Kim Jong-un things he doesn't want to hear is generally a career-threatening move. Uh, you do not assume that even his closest advisors are telling him the truth about a likely US response. A nuclear strike is a real possibility. We have to face it. Let me outline four situations uh, which overlap to an extent, as you'll see, uh, in which the North Koreans might actually use nuclear weapons. Probably in the first instance, the smaller tactical nuclear weapons uh, they have developed, but fortunately not yet tested. The four situations are paranoia, incompetence, an escalation from compellence, and calculation. We talk first about paranoia. I said just now that paranoia may be partly posturing, but it is also partly genuine. Uh, that particularly during the US ROK joint exercises, the, the need for which I, I don't doubt and I fully understand, North Korea goes into a, a almost neurotic frenzy. Um, it convinces itself or it tells the world that this is yet another plan for invasion. I mentioned just a minute ago that the, uh, the decision-making process in North Korea uh, is flawed. Uh, it works badly at the best of times, and the kind of time pressure that a fear of an invasion would place upon the system is not the best of times. There is a real risk that somebody somewhere simply misinterprets a, uh, a US move and presses a button in haste and anxiety, uh, in simple fear. Paradoxically, and please don't misunderstand me, I fully understand the need for deterrence, but the deployment in these exercises of increasingly sophisticated and powerful weapon systems, although in military terms this makes perfect sense, presents the North Korean observers 
with weapons with which they are not familiar, patterns which they have not been previously able to observe. And this degree of uncertainty on the North Korean side clearly increases the risk of a paranoid mistake and a, somebody pressing the button. This danger is exacerbated by the September 2022 nuclear doctrine promulgated in North Korea under which others than the supreme leader, Kim Jong-un, can actually trigger a nuclear counter-strike. Uh, clearly, if you've got more people with their fingers on a nuclear button, then the risk of that kind of mistake escalates. Paranoia, one. Two, incompetence. There is a dangerous tendency, particularly in Washington, D.C., to talk about North Korea as if it were a fully functioning normal state. It is not. North Korean decision-making at the top is flawed, as I said. North Korean decision-making at all levels is ramshackle, prone to blunders, prone to degrees of incompetence that you might normally associate with some of the poorest states of sub-Saharan Africa. And the risk of a simple blunder triggering a nuclear strike is real. Uh, the, for example, uh, the, 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 the September 2022 nuclear doctrine, as I said, uh, delegates nuclear authority in certain circumstances to others than the supreme leader. In the general model of North Korea, it's possible that, for example, uh, Kim Jong-un goes off on one of his extended absences, a pattern which we've seen repeat over many years now, and the, the message goes out somehow that he has been killed, assassinated by the imperialists, somebody anxious not to be seen to neglect their patriotic duty, launches a nuclear strike. Yes, it's stupid. It's Dr. Strangelove's stuff. But this is North Korea. This threat is real. This could happen. Thirdly, compellence gone wrong. I refer you to the excellent uh, national intelligence estimate uh, compiled in January this year. I think it was declassified in June, widely available on the web, uh, which points to the fact that although deterrence remains part of the North Korean nuclear calculus, that compellence, compulsion, uh, coercion, uh, is taking a much greater role. I fully endorse this conclusion, and all North Korean rhetoric over the last several months points in this direction. North Korea faces a range of problems with which its regime is struggling to cope. Uh, they include a stuttering economy, largely self-inflicted after the, uh, the, 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 the lockdown for two years uh, during the pandemic. Um, a, a, but also uh, problems at the top. It's not clear what is going on in the senior leadership, but whichever way you cut the cake, having the senior leader appear alongside his, is she 10 years old, his child daughter, this is not normal North Korean behavior. This is bizarre. It's confusing to us. It must be more confusing to North Korean cadres. Prolonged absences, repeated, even skipping uh, the most sacred of the leader's duties, attending the Kunsu Sam Palace on, uh, on Kim Il-sung's birthday and, and death date. Um, th something is going wrong. This country um, is not stable. Uh, moreover, a theme that hasn't been properly explored, I think, speech after speech after speech by the leadership talking about the need for better ideological education of cadres. What they are saying is that North Korean cadres are increasingly simply ignoring instructions, disobeying orders, probably because they need to spend more time uh, in, should we say, unofficial duties uh, to, to feed their families than actually doing what they're paid to do. You have the sense of people sitting in Pyongyang pulling the leaves of power and nothing very much happening. Uh, the, uh, an ossification of sclerosis in the apparat. All right, so North Korea faces a range of problems. One of the options it has for solving them is good old-fashioned mafia extortion. We have already seen North Korea some years ago um, attack a South Korean island, sink a, a South Korean ship. Uh, I think there's a risk that that attempt uh, to provoke may return associated with thinly disguised demands for money. I believe that the South Korean government at that point was done firm. 
and tell the North Koreans that they weren't going to be blackmailed, at which point North Korea doubles down. It's the only path that North Korea really understands. And it's easy to see that leading to an escalation uh, to the eventual threat and, heaven forfend, possibly even use of nuclear weapons. Fourthly, calculation. Uh, if things continue to deteriorate in North Korea, remember that the North Korean commitment to completing the revolution, to taking over the puppet state in the South, has never been abrogated. People, it, it, this is unthinkable, but we live in a world where the unthinkable happens. Moreover, in many ways, overrunning South Korea is one of the least unattractive options to North Korea. Yes, unthinkable, I know, but if it decides to do it, what does it do? It needs to overrun South Korea quickly before massive US reinforcements turn the balance against it, and the only way it could do this is to destroy South Korea's military infrastructure quickly with multiple tactical nuclear attacks and then swarm. In that situation, and particularly if North Korea believes that it is doomed, that for whatever reason its economy is collapsing, that its society turned against it, it has nothing to lose. The use of nuclear weapons at a first track capability, as set out in the nuclear doctrine of 2022, uh, is about as rational as any North Korean decision becomes. I hope I've scared you. Good. Um, what do we do? The well, there's been a lot of talk already this morning about deterrence. I endorse this. Uh, trying to deter North Korea from these courses of action is extremely important. It is not, however, foolproof. The risk is that although the messaging going out from Washington from Seoul is very clear, it may not be understood by North Korea in the sense in which it's intended. If you read uh, the North Korean responses uh, to the exercises, they talk about US and South Korean escalation, so provoking and justifying North Korean escalation and you get into a, an upward spiral uh, towards a bad place. Uh, once again, I insist, do not underestimate North Korean paranoia. Uh, is there a diplomatic solution to all this? For the time being, no. Ever since the breakup of the Hanoi summit, North Korea has had zero confidence in any dialogue with the United States. It's not surprising that constant calls uh, to North Korea go unanswered. And perhaps because uh, it believes that Moon Jae-in uh, was instrumental in the failure of that summit, relations with the South also have been strained. I don't see any dialogue between Pyongyang and Seoul anytime soon. As the North Korean economy stutters, it's possible that we will get an opening, uh, but we are not there yet. For the time being, we just have to keep hoping that North Korea does not panic completely, that uh, what rationality it has is preserved, that Kim Jong-un starts to adopt the practices of his late, and dare we say it, lamented father, who, whilst not a nice man, did actually consult widely before reaching any decision. Kim Jong-un has a habit, it seems, of making snap decisions, which is probably bad practice. And re reinforce the deterrence uh, that we have been so carefully building up. This is not foolproof, but it's probably the best option we have. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be back in my uh, second hometown, uh, Seoul, again. And I am delighted uh, to be among uh, so many uh, old friends and close friends, and in particular, uh, Ambassador Pak. Uh, thank you very much for uh, revitalizing uh, this dialogue, which I uh, once attended uh, many, many years ago. And it's, it's good to, uh, to see it uh, once again in, uh, in operation. Uh, I don't know what to say uh, following my good friend uh, John Everard here, except to say that I associate myself with every word that you just uttered as a long time North Korea hand. Uh, the other thing I should say is uh, it's unusual and delightful for me to be on the same program as a chemical engineer. 
Uh, those of you who know my background uh, know that I actually started out as a chemical engineering major, and I woke up one morning at university and decided that studying Chinese, Korean, and Japanese was infinitely easier than studying partial differential equations, so here I am. Uh, today, I'm going to do, in my, uh, the very few minutes allotted to me, uh, three very quick things. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of this alliance and what it has accomplished, and it has accomplished a lot. The second thing I will talk about is how this alliance has evolved and matured in a very interesting and important direction. And the third thing uh, will be to share a few brief thoughts on some considerations going forward, uh, particularly for the Republic of Korea, but not just the Republic of Korea, as this alliance moves into its next 70 years. So let me jump in quickly. By any standard, uh, the USROK alliance has been a remarkable success. Uh, perhaps most importantly, and this relates to the points that, uh, that John made, deterrence has held. Uh, peace has been maintained, and the shield that this alliance has provided uh, over the uh, decades uh, has made it possible for a remarkable transformation uh, to take place in this country. Uh, the Korean people have brought about dramatic social change. They have created an economic miracle, and we're standing in the middle of part of that economic miracle here in Gangnam. Uh, they have ended authoritarianism, and they have established a very lively and vibrant democracy. And today, Korea stands tall as a global model of democracy, development, freedom, and strength. All of those things have been made possible by this alliance, and going forward, this alliance will be infinitely important in maintaining the capacity of Korea and the United States to continue to move forward together. The second thing I want to say is the transformation that's taken place uh, in this alliance. Uh, Korea's rising strength and self-confidence over the decades uh, have led to a rebalancing of the U.S. ROK alliance, and as a former alliance manager, I took part in, in this process of rebalancing the alliance. And this has resulted in a more equal and sensible partnership between Seoul and Washington. Today, uh, Korea is seeking a broader international role by building a broader strategic partnership with the United States and pursuing its vision of becoming a global pivotal state. Let me also add, very importantly, that as someone who has worked for many years in both Korea and Japan, uh, I have been extremely impressed by the courageous, forward-looking leadership that we've seen in Seoul and Tokyo. That leadership has enabled both countries to improve ties and, despite their very tragic history, uh, establish a new partnership based on a shared commitment to the principles on which a free and open Indo-Pacific region is based. Korea and Japan also share a concern about a nuclear-armed and very dangerous North Korea and an aggressive China. Shared goals and principles and common threats have given birth to the historic new U.S. ROK Japan trilateral partnership announced at the Camp David summit. If it is well nourished and managed carefully, this new partnership will mesh well with other emerging, emerging minilateral partnerships in the region, including the Quad and AUKUS. And those partnerships are already reshaping the security and economic architecture in the Indo-Pacific region. And in my view, uh, Korea's future membership in other so-called minilateral partnerships is not out of the question. Third, let me look forward for a few moments here. As the Republic of Korea pursues a new global role, it faces several tasks, challenges, and choices. These are tasks, challenges, and choices it will have to make, but also ones that it will have to make in consultation with its close partners, including the United States. The first of these is a broader global partnership with Washington will require Seoul to decide how best to engage on those aspects of America's security agenda that go beyond the defense of the Republic of Korea. Korea will have to ask itself going forward what it is prepared to do or not to do 
as the case may be, on issues like support for Ukraine, dealing with a possible Taiwan contingency, and, of course, a more confrontational U.S. posture that we're already seeing towards an aggressive and expansionist Russia. The second task is the goals of South Korea's evident desire for a deeper relationship with NATO seem largely undefined. I've been extremely impressed with how Seoul has reached out to NATO, but also how NATO collectively and individually, the countries have reached out to Seoul. Seoul must think through what it seeks from and what it is prepared to contribute to a more robust relationship with NATO in the coming years. Third, with the United States and China engaged in a generational str struggle for strategic dominance in the Indo-Pacific and beyond, Beijing, in my view, will inevitably, as it has done in the past, exert pressure on the ROK as Seoul expands its tactical and strategic coordination with Washington and with Tokyo. The Republic of Korea should work closely with its U.S. ally and its Japanese partner to mitigate and deflect Chinese pressure ensuring that Beijing does not damage Korea's economy, supply chains, or role as a key provider of advanced technologies to international markets. In this connection, Washington and Tokyo must be more sensitive to the price that China may try to make the Republic of Korea pay for its participation in closer relations with the United States and Japan. And so I think both Washington and Tokyo and this, I think, was something that Ambassador Park had suggested, need to be more attentive uh, to Seoul's needs going forward. The fourth point going forward is that Seoul must decide whether the extended deterrence assurances and commitments it has received from the United States will be adequate as the peninsular and regional security environments continue to evolve in East Asia. The Washington Declaration contains a far-reaching new commitment by the United States including the establishment of the nuclear consultative group aimed at reassuring Seoul that all the tools of the U.S. arsenal will remain committed to the alliance and to the defense of Korea. But new challenges, especially from North Korea, however, may require Seoul to seek further and stronger assurances in the future. And I hope that the United States will continue to be sensitive to the need to ramp up and strengthen those commitments in the years to come. Washington Declaration, and this is the fifth point, formed a remarkable new partnership between the United States and its two East Asian allies. This new relationship has the potential to transform ties among the three countries and fundamentally alter the security architecture in this region. But the foundation upon which this new relationship rests is only as strong as the leadership, goodwill, and political commitment of each of the three partners. Political changes in any of the three capitals could weaken the solidarity and shared purpose that have been created by this remarkable enterprise. For its part, Seoul will need to ensure that shifting political winds do not undermine or erase what has been achieved. And I would direct the same cautionary note to my own government in Washington, especially as we approach an election next year. The sixth and final point is that the Republic of Korea will face the challenge of keeping its policy on North Korea on as steady a course as possible in the months and years to come. One of the major contributing factors to the current level of trilateral harmony that we are witnessing among the United States, the ROK, and Japan is that their respective approaches on North Korea are now largely in sync. That's unusual, and it's a good thing. However, history shows that ROK policy towards North Korea can shift radically. Today, in my view, political divisions, including differences over how to deal with North Korea, are growing in the Republic of Korea. The challenge for Seoul going forward will be how to maintain a steady course in the face of possible shifts in political and electoral winds. Let me close by saying that the history of U.S. ROK relations, and I've been around uh, not for 70 years, but for uh, 54 years as I've worked on this, uh, on this uh, account, that history tells us that the alliance is strong, dynamic, growth-oriented, 
and capable of surmounting even the most difficult obstacles. Goodwill, hard work, and mutual respect will ensure that this continues to be the case in the years to come. There is every reason to believe that the next 70 years of the Alliance will be as productive, fruitful, and impressive as the previous 70 years have been. And if new challenges, the ones I mentioned and more, are man managed well, the best days of this Alliance may still be ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President Park and the Che Institute, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion today. Um, I'm going to use my opening remarks to outline what I see as the key factors underpinning the notable strengthening and expansion in scope of the US ROK Alliance uh, over the last couple of years. And then I'll discuss some of the challenges that I see ahead, perhaps not as far out as the next 70 years, but the next seven years, and put on the table a few policy recommendations on how Washington and Seoul can navigate respect respective domestic challenges and mutual external threats that are likely to come down the pike. First, as previous speakers have uh, already elaborated in their remarks, the US ROK Alliance has been remarkably uh, revitalized under the leadership of President Biden and President Yoon over the last two years. Extended deterrence mechanisms have been significantly enhanced. The alliance has been expanded in scope and geographical reach with greater US ROK Japan trilateral cooperation, deepened ties with NATO's and gro uh, growing economic and technological coordination as well. I think without a doubt, the striking achievements that have been made by Seoul and Washington uh, over the last two years would not have been possible without the opportune rise of two administrations uh, that, are, that are committed to strengthening the alliance and the bureaucratic energy that's been dedicated to this shared objective. I think the Yoon administration in particular has gone above and beyond to improve bilateral relations with Tokyo uh, in order to pave the way for unprecedented trilateral cooperation with Japan and the United States. But notwithstanding the dedication and great efforts by both administrations, we must also recognize that extraordinary geopolitical uh, circumstances or developments have enabled the two allies to take their shared agenda uh, much further than if these uh, activities had been undertaken under less turbulent geopolitical circumstances. So these developments include the progressive deterioration of the security situation in the Korean Peninsula with the DPRK's continued uh, advancement of its nuclear and uh, missile programs and diminishing hope for any sort of diplomatic breakthrough since the Hanoi summit, heightening concerns about China's military buildup and its assertive posture in the region, and the potential for regional contingencies in the Taiwan Strait, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine and growing concerns about the return of great power war. Uh, also, the strengthening of China, Russia, and North Korea's ties amid the three states' increasing isolation from the West. Um, so all of these developments that have unfolded over a short period of time have really heightened security concerns in Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington, and I think have reinforced the value of uh, drawing near to allies and shoring up like-minded coalitions. Now, looking ahead to the challenges, uh, while the support for the U.S. ROK alliance is robust among political elites, especially in Washington and in Seoul, it's unclear that the progress that's been made can be sustained beyond the current Biden and Yoon administrations, particularly in the face of increasing political uh, polarization in both countries. In just over a year, the United States will hold its presidential election, which as of today looks like will be a contest between uh, President Biden and former President Trump for the White House. The two are neck to neck in polls, and so this indicates that there's a real possibility of a return of America first policy and uh, uh, stresses to the progress that's been made on strengthening the alliance. Uh, while the U.S. alliances enjoy uh, bipartisan support on Capitol Hill and in the U.S. bureaucracy, as we saw during the Trump years, uh, the, the fact is the proclivities of the White House occupant has an outside impact on all aspects of U.S. foreign policy, including how the United States relates and interacts with these allies. 
There's also a risk that South Korean public support for the U.S.-ROK alliance may begin to erode if the public begins to perceive that the costs versus benefits of the alliance uh, is not in South Korea's favor. And many uh, previous speakers have alluded to various stressors. For instance, if the U.S. small yard high fence approach is seen as becoming increasingly burdensome for South Korean companies, uh, and or if China decides to massively economically retaliate against South Korean companies and Washington's response is seen as inadequate. Uh, there's also the case that if South Korean contributions to the war in Ukraine or participation in contingency planning for a potential Taiwan scenario is seeing, seen as having a net negative impact on, China, on South Korea's uh, national interests. The alliance and trilateral cooperation with Japan could also come under stress with the resurgence of historical uh, history-related disagreements and grievances, which is not something that the executive branches in either Seoul or Tokyo can control uh, given their democratic systems. Again, while the UN administration has taken extraordinary steps to improve relations with Tokyo on the grounds that Seoul and Tokyo's uh, shared security interests are greater than their differences and uh, on the grounds that the two uh, countries must be more future-oriented than looking to the past, uh, it's not clear whether this position is fully shared across the wide swath of South Korea's electorate, uh, except among those who support at the UN administration. So I think the clear partisan divide that we see guarantees that if and when there's a change in ruling parties in future presidential elections, uh, the progress made to the ROK-Japan relationship and trilateral cooperation as a result could be unraveled in some ways. Uh, in addition to the domestic political challenges to the US-ROK alliance, the alliance also faces significant external challenges. Uh, first and foremost, while the U.S. and ROK have taken significant steps to increase deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Pyongyang, there seems to be virtually no near to midterm progress, progress, uh, prospects for actively halting the DPRK's uh, advancement of its WMD program, as well as relaunching diplomatic efforts without, significant, without which significant progress on advancing peace in the Korean Peninsula will be difficult. In addition, as U.S.-China relations deteriorate, it's becoming increasingly difficult to discuss with China uh, the, the prospects for working on North Korea together. And just as Washington has doubled down on strengthening its alliances and its partnerships, Beijing has also been looking uh, for ways to strengthen its circle of friends and to pull in its partners closer, including partners like North Korea and Russia. Relatedly, North Korea-Russia ties have also strengthened as an increasingly isolated Moscow looks for support and military supplies as it continues its unjust war against Ukraine. And so it'll be important to watch not just what kind of agreements uh, materialize from the Kim's visit to Russia this week, but to think through ways uh, uh, that an emerging, uh, re-emerging Russia-North Korea access could potentially um, also turn into trilateral cooperation with China and impact the security situation in the Korean Peninsula and the broader region. So to conclude, I'll briefly put a few policy recommendations on the table to address the challenges that I've outlined. First, I think knowing the domestic political challenges that may come down the pike in both the United States and ROK, it'll be imperative for both administrations today to strengthen public support for the alliance across the broader electorate and to cultivate bipartisan or multipartisan advocates for the uh, progress that's been made so far. And of course, the same goes for the ROK Japan and ROK Europe uh, ties. In addition, uh, Washington and Seoul uh, should continue to work on strengthening mutual economic benefits and mechanisms for countering and addressing economic coercion when it's employed, uh, and fighting the perception that the United States is leaving its allies to take on the brunt of competition with China. And this will be very important for Washington in particular to sustain the great momentum that we've seen in revitalizing uh, the US alliance networks.
Also, the U.S. and ROK will need to be very clear-eyed about the potential hardening of a China-Russia DPRK axis and urgently examine the potential ramifications of growing bilateral or tri triangular cooperation among the three states. We should think through what are the factors that are bringing these three together, where are their gaps and clear differences in their interests among the three so that these can be leveraged in a way to preempt concerning developments. And finally, I think Washington and Seoul should also seek, at the same time, to stabilize ties and rebuild diplomatic channels with Beijing. Too often, uh, strengthening relations with allies and improving relations with China is seen as an either-or proposition. But I think this is a very simplistic view, and stabilizing relations with Beijing should help uh, alleviate some of the stresses that I've outlined uh, in my talk. But of course, this is not an easy proposition, but it's something that uh, should be worked at. And I think President Yoon's uh, remarks earlier this week that he seeks to restart uh, ROK Japan-China uh, trilateral summits uh, is a very promising uh, de development, and we'll have to watch that closely. So let me stop here, and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be part of this excellent panel. Uh, let me first discuss about some general view of the RKUS Alliance and then touch upon the issue of technology because we are dealing with a uh, technology issue in this panel. Uh, first, let me discuss the relationship between changing international order and the function of the role of uh, our QS alliance. It is not enough to say that the current international politics is defined by balance of interests and balance of power within a given international order. This is because the fundamental international order itself is changing. As Professor Kim Sung Han explained in his uh, keynote, the liberal rules based order that emerged after the Second World War is facing fundamental challenges, internal and external challenges, and various actors are suggesting alternative international order which uh, can weaken the liberal aspect of it. The role of alliances in this, in this context is not only deal with security threats within uh, the existing order, but also to create uh, the international order that can deal with new challenges while maintaining the liberal international order making the uh, Iraq-U.S. Uh, alliance a order alliance in the midst of balance of order. South Korea has suggested that the core of its diplomacy is not only to maintain the existing international liberal order, but also to strengthen and find the better version of the liberal order, dealing with uh, many challenges, internal contradictions, uh, such as the problem of uh, globalization, weakening liberal uh, economic order, um, how to maintain the new technology within a, a good regime, and also external challenges that, uh, that seek to change the status quo by force and coercion. In this regard, the uh, RKUS alliance has been called upon to play an expanded role, and uh, our President uh, Yoon uh, defined the alliance uh, very comprehensively saying that uh, the alliance is military, industrial, technology, information, and cultural alliance. Uh, in terms of international security order, the alliance recognizes the importance of securing a military advantage based on technology, especially as the fourth industrial revolution progresses and new technologies become more important. In the midst of strategic competition with China, the United States seeks to protect its overwhelming military superiority over China. It does so by pursuing its own efforts, including its own military spending, weapons capability, military strategy. In addition, it seeks to increase military cooperation with its allies to refrain China's efforts to change the military status quo. Uh, the U.S. is trying to outmaneuver China in the new technology race by developing its own science and technology ecosystem for military innovation while keeping civilian and military technologies closely aligned. 
Then, policy of geotechnology poses the following questions. First, to what extent and in which area should technology be controlled? Second, to what extent can the U.S. achieve support and policy coordination not only from the U.S. but also from its allies? Third, how can this balance be achieved between the U.S. government and private and commercial sectors? Fourth, will technology, uh, technological de uh, decoupling from China that end up fostering China's own technological advances? Uh, fifth, will the separation between the U.S. and China not fuel China's more aggressive military strategy? Uh, then, with, uh, while the ROK-U.S. alliance has a wide range of technology-related content, and while technology provides mutual benefits in many areas, it is worth noting the implications of technology cooperation in the military sector. Especially on the manufacturing side of technology, the U.S. industrial base has been greatly weakened, so the manufacturing base in South Korea and Japan is a critical area for future advances in new technology. In this process, cooperation with the Allies is of paramount importance, so the RKUS and trilateral cooperation, including Japan, has strong military and security implications. Uh, first of all, in preparation for future wars, the Biden administration issued an executive order on August 9th, uh, just prior to the Camp David summit, announcing new guidelines to review and regulate U.S. public investment in cutting-edge technologies such as supercomputers, artificial intelligence, and uh, quant uh, quantum computing. These restraints on U.S. public investment, which will be further refined by the working group, are a key component of U.S. technology policy, uh, along with the restrictions ex uh, on exports of advanced technology such as semiconductors last year uh, in uh, October. Given uh, all these developments, I want to address several challenges ahead uh, for the Alliance and uh, in general. Uh, first, looking back at the history of the so-called Revolutions in Military Affairs, RMA, uh, which is uh, widely discussed in IR literature, advanced military technologies are monopolized by a few countries and eventually spread and diffused to other countries through various mechanisms. In the end, it matters what kind of military and security order the technologically advanced states of the monopoly period create. The agenda then shifts to creating a new regulatory regime on top of the diffused military technology. Currently, new technologies are having an enormous impact on the military order, and the United States and China are competing fiercely. If the United States and its allies can work together to outpace revisionist forces in military new technologies, the international order they create during this period will be crucial. Uh, over time, other nations will eventually acquire the new technologies as well, so diplomatic efforts to, uh, will, uh, will be needed to make, uh, to capitalize on the power advantage while also ensuring that the regulatory regime is in their favor. While the U.S. is currently st uh, strongly pursuing measures such as technology export controls and investment restrictions against China, China will eventually close the technology gap uh, with the U.S. through indigenous technology development and various technology acquisition efforts. In addition to the question of how long this will take, it will also be important to see if a common perception of technology regulation can be created uh, between U.S. and China in this process. Second, uh, the United States will need help from its allies in pursuing a technology policy toward China. Even if U.S. imposes technology controls in bilateral relations, the effectiveness is reduced if the technology of its allies is transferred to China. The economic interest of allies may be harmed uh, in this process, and the cohesion between U.S. and its allies may be weakened if the U.S. overly forces them to coordinate their policies in the interest of strategic competition. The U.S. should work to ensure that its allies uh, economic interests are safeguarded, 
while at the same time taking joint action in areas related to advanced weapons technology. There needs to be close consultation on how to maintain the level of economic interdependence between the United States and, in, and its allies in de-risking paradigm these days that the U.S. is proposing. Uh, third, current military technologies are largely converging with technologies from the commercial sector. And there is an ecosystem of technological innovation that is closely linked to basic scientific and technological research. In this context, it is necessary to revitalize and preserve the overall technological innovation ecosystem. And it's also important to promote the economic interests of the private sector. In the end, it's a matter of rebalancing the public and private sectors and securing a rebalance between military technology and basic scientific research. This process is also closely linked to the relationship between the United States and its allies, academic collaboration in technological innovation and military implications should be coupled with efforts to promote private sector economic benefits. Two more points. Uh, first, the technological gap between the United States and its allies and the imbalance in weapons technology will be an important factor. In emerging technologies, only a few countries have the core technologies and manufacturing capabilities. So efforts should be made to create mutually beneficial military technology supply chains. For example, the Camp David Summit foreshadowed future technological cooperation among three countries in a variety of areas. In the high-tech sector, uh, though, South Korea is lagging far behind, so technology transfers from the United States are highly needed. In the future, technological cooperation should take place while maintaining strategic coordination between the United States and South Korea on overall military and security strategies. Furthermore, such cooperation must go beyond the bilateral rela uh, relations, including Japan. Lastly, the military technology supply chain in Northeast Asia, uh, unlike the general in the Pacific, is likely to be increasingly characterized by conflict and confrontation. The summit uh, between Kim and Putin, as well as core military technology cooperation under the guise of space technology, will further accelerate competition over military technology supply chains. South Korea, the United States, and Japan have pledged to immediately consult on uh, common security threats, share information, and coordinate joint responses in the document of commitment to consult. It remains to be seen how the three countries will design their technological cooperation under changing circumstances, and we need to keep a uh, close eye on China's policy in this respect while trying to find a common ground on technological regulation uh, where possible. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for having me here in this prestigious dialogue between ROK and the U.S. And I would like to share uh, my view on this, the technological impact on the, the alliance. About two days ago, I met Professor Chris Miller uh, in a, the World Knowledge Forum, which is hosted by the South Korean media company. Uh, in the afternoon session, we had an opportunity to have a discussion about the possible impact of the U.S. Chips and Science Act in 2022 in the next few years for the global supply chain of a semiconductor industry. And yesterday, I also had an opportunity to have a discussion uh, with an Assistant Secretary, uh, Mr. Ramin Tului of uh, the State Department of the U.S. And we had a discussion about the, what is the detailed measure we can cooperate with to, uh, to cope with some, some possible the risk or possible uncertainties and maybe uh, we can make some progress to, uh, to cope with these risks. Interestingly, I found out that we have some, some common interest in, in this kind of the reorganization or even reconstructing of global supply chain uh, or global value chain of semiconductor industry. 
To this end, I would like to share my view with the experts, colleagues, and friends here that what is the possible risks or possible challenges or possible tasks on which the two countries can co-work with. The first one is that the, some kind of the reorganization, which is actually entitled the bifurcation. So in last week, interestingly, we have a news from the China. So one of the representatives of the smartphone maker in Huawei announced its brand new smartphone named the Mate 60 Pro. And it is strongly believed that there is some mobile AP chip inside the phone, which can be fabricated by the, another Chinese company named SMIC. And the expert says that those chips were, would have been made by the 7 nanometer foundry process in the SMIC. It means that some experts say that this kind of progress in China is some kind of exemplary representative examples showing that the US sanctions on Chinese semiconductor is limited, if not incomplete. Or some says that it's some matter of time or some matter of money for the Chinese, Chinese semiconductor industry to make a further, further progress. And I think that this will bring us to uh, to, to think about the possibility of the bifurcation. Uh, for example, we can think about there's, there can be some separation of the global supply chain. One is centered at US and its allies, such as South Korea and Japan. The other one can be driven by China and its friends, such as Russia or North Korea, or even other authoritarian government countries. So the, all, all, all I have in this concern is that we may suffer some kind of the negative effect, such as a shrinkage of global market size. It means, that, for example, U.S. chip makers or U.S. chip making fabrication equipment companies such as Applied Materials, LAM Research, or KRA, or some Japanese companies such as Tokyo Electron, or Net Dutch company ASML, has already experienced about the 30 or 40 percent uh, the decrease in the, the, uh, the profit because the pro prohibition of X export to the China. So our concern is that how we can cope with this kind of the uncertainties. So the first one is that maybe we can make some another kind of the you know, semiconductor market around the world, for example, in Southeast areas and the other areas too. And the second point I'd like is that how the two countries make some good progress to making new standards and new technical advancements. For example, we have some certain standards such as JEDEC in memory chips. But in this area, in this era, as President Park said, we have a new, brand new memory chips such as HBM, uh, which is actually high bandwidth memory, uh, very critical to the artificial intelligence. But there is no clear standard for this kind of the HBM or the other kinds of the advanced uh, chips. For this, how can two countries make a good progress to making new standards which can lead all the, the semiconductor industry? The third point is some strategic uh, consideration between, I mean, the across all the industry. Today, I will focus on the semiconductor industry, but we need to think about other industries such as batteries. For example, there is advantage for the Chinese part in the global supply chain for the batteries, especially for the electric vehicle batteries, because they have uh, some strong uh, supply chain starting from the raw materials, uh, some to refinery, or some even cell or module fabrication too. Uh, for example, they share about 90% of the energy materials, which is graphite in mainland China and North Korea too. So it means that there is some kind of the strategic point for the China to trade with the other countries, including South Korea. So it means that they can make some deal with the other countries using their advantages in battery side, and it means that they will circumvent or even uh, some confront the semiconductor limitations given by the U.S. sanctions. So the point is that how we can cope with this possible the combination of the multiple industries across the industries. So that 
I will uh, discuss more about this in the Q&A session if time allows. And in summary, we need to think about some technology and industry perspective on this U.S. and South Korea alliance effectiveness. And maybe we can make some further progress in uh, these uh, challenges and the point. And thank you for the listening, and I would be happy to take any question in the Q&A session. Thank you. Yeah. So um, welcome back. Um, I would like to thank all our speakers for wonderful presentations, all of you. And it has really given us a lot of fodder for discussion, actually um, too much um, topics to discuss. Um, but I would first like to give all of you the opportunity, because we have heard all, all six of you talk, um, to maybe add on or raise questions that you heard um, from the presentations of other speakers, and then we'll launch into some questions. But um, anyone would like to sort of make some comment? Yes, Evan. Yes, Mr. Veer. I can't resist the opportunity. First of all, it really is a great pleasure to be on this uh, days with this distinguished group. Uh, Ambassador Everard uh, did a wonderful job of terrifying all of us in this room a short while ago, uh, delivering a speech that I myself have delivered very often. <laughs> and uh, brilliant minds think alike, I suppose. But what you, what you said about North Korea's preemptive strike policy, first strike policy, has some implications that are deeply, deeply disturbing beyond the obvious. Um, it, it's very clear from the language that was used when the North Koreans announced this, this new program that their intention is regardless of whether the United States and the Republic of Korea have carried out any ta attacks, uh, are planning any attacks, or are making any moves that suggest that an attack is possible, that they reserve the right to conduct a first strike. Uh, presumably on the Republic of Korea, on the United States, and perhaps also Japan. When you think this through, uh, if, if, if the North Koreans are serious about the language that they have used, uh, it suggests that they are reserving this right to carry out a first strike, regardless of our intentions. This poses a very interesting question for US leaders and policymakers. Uh, I cannot imagine an American president waiting to be hit by a North Korean nuclear weapon. I cannot imagine a South Korean president waiting to be hit by a North Korean nuclear weapon. Are we now in this very dangerous, brave new world of having to consider whether we, as allies and partners, uh, should be putting in place, if we haven't already done so, our own plans to prevent North Korea from doing what the North Koreans have already said they are prepared to do? I think it is a question that must be answered at this point. Okay. Uh, to answer this, of course, is rather more difficult. I think that the quick answer is yes. I mean, you have to respond to, to like with like. But the escalatory risk is obvious. Uh, if the North Koreans believe that the United States or the ROK may be considering a first strike, then their natural counter would be to up essentially the possibility that they go first. It's the old Cold War calculation. You want to have first strike advantage, but to develop that first strike advantage, you risk provoking your opponent into the exactly the same posture. Through all the decades of the Cold War, nobody found a coherent answer to this problem, and I don't suppose that we're going to find one this morning. But it is a very great risk, and it's the kind of situation that could get out of control very quickly. Um, Dr. Yeo, you wanted to also comment? It was more of a question than a comment for our um, two uh, elder statesmen here, because uh, Ambassador Everett, you know, he frightened all of us with North Korea. I was waiting for him to speak more on, on the alliance so I can ask this question now. 
If there's still so much concern about North Korea, I'm wondering from your perspectives if you think the shift to broadening the lines to address uh, you know, Indo-Pacific areas, or Indo-Pacific issues, looking at Taiwan or China, if that's going to detract us from what perhaps you might think is the real frightening scenario, which is still North Korea. And maybe if I can bring in Dr. Kim as well, too, because I know you, uh, she talked a little bit about some of these broader issue areas. Um, so from your vantage point, if you may have seen, if you see uh, the lines being uh, pulled away. And then the other question I had, you asked if there was any comments that struck us from uh, this panel. Our, uh, Dr. Kwan and Dr. Uh, Chan talked about some of these new uh, technology issues that I think the alliance really has to address. I haven't heard the word revolution in military affairs uh, used very recently, and I don't really hear it so much in reference to the U.S.-South Korea alliance, but we talk a lot about coordination on, on semiconductors, but in terms of their military application, and I, I didn't really think about the fact that Korea is very far behind technologically than uh, the United States when it comes to because defense, uh, defense technologies and capabilities. But if there really is that gap, it's going to be a problem when, uh, when we think about alliance coordination. And so I was wondering if uh, others had maybe thoughts about how we can move that, um, move forward on not just you know, supply chain uh, coordination uh, in terms of economic security, but then uh, moving forward also on defense industrial uh, production and capacity as well. Um, if maybe Dr. Kim could first um, start the discussion and then we move over to um, Professor Chan or Kwon to um, follow up on some of the perspectives from the Korean or the military technology side. Dr. Kim? So, Andrew, your question was on the U.S. ROC alliance and how it's dealing with North Korea? Well, whether we're losing focus on real concerns that Dr. Everett has pointed out, that it's, you know, he makes it seem like this is really the issue that we should be addressing. But as, we've, as several commentators, especially on the U.S. side, has mentioned, you know, we're excited that the next 70 years may look broader than just Mm -hmm. U.S.-South Korea alliance on you know, defense security issues that's brought into the Indo-Pacific. Right. I think that's a great question. I would say that much of the revitalization of the U.S. ROC alliance has actually been focused on just exactly the North Korean threat. And so I would say the focus hasn't been lost. This is traditionally where I think the United States and South Korea have sort of had different priorities, right? But I, I, I see a real alignment in the way the Biden administration and the UN administration has been working. I think there's a great recognition in Washington about South Korea's extended deterrence challenges. So I think North Korea is a threat. Now, having said that, as I mentioned in my initial remarks, it's the diplomacy piece that's missing. And I do know that both the Biden and UN administrations have reached out to the North Koreans. You know, they haven't been forthcoming, but we're just kind of in this impasse. And that's one area where I haven't really seen new ideas or any sort of prospects. And so that's something that the allies perhaps should be working on together. And that's where the challenge is that, you know, in the past, I think where we've seen a lot of progress in diplomacy, China has, a, has been involved. But, um, you know, we don't, it's, it's becoming much more difficult to work with the Chinese on North Korea. So that remains a real challenge. Um, uh, Professor Chan, I mean, maybe you could um, address uh, what Dr. Yeo said, but also what Dr. Kim has talked about, the fact that diplomacy seems to be um, further away in terms of um, relating and resolving the North Korea issue at the present time. Right. Uh, first about... Uh Evan's question, uh, preemptive strike by North Korea using tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea, even though we have a uh, Washington declaration, if uh, North Korea acquires ICBM capability to attack uh, U.S. continent with nuclear warheads and then have very elaborate uh, technical nuclear weapons, then uh, if North Korea attacks South Korea with low-yield tactical weapons, uh, denying possibly uh, help from the United States using the threat to attack uh, U.S. with uh, strategic nuclear weapons, then uh, will the U.S. Uh, retaliate with uh, nuclear weapons against North Korea's tactical nuclear weapons attack? That's a very hard question, I think. Uh, maybe uh, some South Korean uh, political scientists think that uh, there will be conventional weapon retaliation rather than 
uh, nuclear weapon retaliation because it will evolve, escalate into the out, uh, the, the very uh, uh, outright uh, nuclear war. So uh, to deter that kind of North Korea's preemptive uh, nuclear attacks, we have to be very concrete about uh, uh, the war scenarios, how we can cope with uh, North Korea's those kinds of aggression, because deterrence is based on the communication with the enemy. Uh, when we talk about preparedness with very concrete scenarios, then North Korea will be restrained in their preemptive strike. So I think there will be a lot to be done uh, in making concrete uh, the nuclear, uh, in a call, uh, the consultation group. Uh, that's first thing. Second thing, uh, for the new technology, even though United States has a predominant superiority over China so far, but uh, the radically changing revolutionary potential of a fourth industrial revolution, uh, nuclear, uh, military technology is, is huge. Uh, by combining, for example, nuclear capability with AI or uh, quantum computing, if China has, uh, you know, precedence, uh, if they excel United States in that area, uh, the future balance of power will change very radically. Uh, so we have to cope uh, with that uh, possibility. Uh, so not just using the police means of uh, export control uh, or, you know, the uh, investment uh, restrictions we need very, uh, you know, fundamental uh, policy coordination with allies. There was another point uh, I forgot. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're welcome to bring okay. it up later when you remember. Yep, yep. But uh, for the time being, let's uh, let's move on to Professor Kwan. I mean, um, the this military technology, the application of the high technology quantum computing, the chips into the military world is another area that we haven't really delved into much. But in terms of the uh, the bifurcation, for example. Um, how is this going to impact, um, you know, the, the technology, uh, the war is going to impact mi the military future of um, both countries in both regions? Okay, thank you for asking those critical questions about the, the civil and the military dual purpose application of this advanced technology. Uh, for example, there was some, some strong multilateral organization which is called COCOM in Cold Era, and they are targeting to in, the prohibiting the export of some advanced technology in that area, something like satellite communication and the semiconductor or the other kinds of the technology, uh, focusing on the two to the control the progresses in the communities, the communist parties. In this era, we have also observed that uh, there is some kind of the, the controlling for the, the, pro, the exporting of the advanced technology. For example, uh, before the U.S. sanction on the Chinese semiconductor, there was some the one of the, the great import, one of the great import in China of. Uh, the AI chips made by the NVIDIA in America was People's Liberating Army in China. But after the sanction, there was no kind of measures to export the NVIDIA chips to China. It means that China uh, has tried to circumvent or even overcome the limitations by making their own chips. But there is some kind of technical challenges for the Chinese part because they have their own foundries, they have their own designing tools, but they don't have some advanced memory chips such as high bandwidth memory. To this end, there can be some, some critical threat given by the Chinese government on some South Korean memory companies such as SK Hynix located in the Wuxi region in China because the Chinese the semiconductor uh, fabs located in Wuxi uh, make some kind of the advanced memory chips. So for this, maybe we need to prepare some measure uh, to, uh, to address this kind of threat. The second one is the chemical compound, the semiconductor. Actually, the chemical compound, the semiconductor, is different from some conventional and silicon-based semiconductor chips. Actually, this is some kind of this some special semiconductor targeting for special functionality. Uh, for example, we can think about the gallium arsenide or gallium nitride or indium gallium nitride 
I'm sorry about this professional jargon. So, but anyway, uh, this kind of this uh, chemical compound semiconductor is especially uh, used for, for the military purpose. Uh, because they can detect near infrared or even mid infrared, which is actually critical for the spy satellite of the China. So it means that they can, they, but there is some advantage for the China because they have raw materials uh, to make these chemical compound semiconductor chips. So it means that we need to prepare uh, to overcome this kind of a threat given by the chemical compound semiconductor too. So it means that by combining these two aspects, maybe we can call it that we need to, to prepare new measure, uh, such as new measure for the multiplication factors based on the semiconductor chips uh, to control these kind of the military applications. That's the point I would like to share with the audience. Um, it, it is very technical in many ways, but it does sort of raise a two sort of more general questions. Um, Will we be able to, I mean, um, this kind of technical challenge, technology challenge seems to be very vital um, to the future, but is it possible in the, in the pathways and the policies that we are taking right now in terms of trying to isolate China, um, uh, that is it possible to be able to meet these challenges sufficiently? Um, maybe you can start, and maybe it's sort of a general question, and that many of that some of our other panelists could also address. Uh, so I will focus on some technical terms, but let me briefly introduce why it is what is possible and what is not possible for now for the China Chinese semiconductor chips. As I said, they have some good foundries named SMIC, and they have they already proved their facility and performances to make a seven nanometer fabrication. But it is a matter of time and money, but the money is a problem for the China because it takes so much money. I mean, about at least a triple or even the quadruple times higher cost compared to the TSMC and the Samsung Electronics. So some experts are not sure about that, there, there, is there any kind of economic uh, profitability or economic motivation for the China to make progress in the seven nanometer or even the shorter nanometers such as five or three nanometers? But this kind of the five, four, three, or even Armstrong level, the fabrication tool is very critical uh, to make progress in artificial intelligence chips and the other kind of the high performance chips, which is also critical for the military purpose. So I think it is, it's a grave, grave challenge for the China part. The other one is that, as I said, the memory, they have a two, at least two or three technical generation the gap between the, the South Korean company and the Chinese memory company. So it is very hard for them to overcome this two or three generation gap because it takes so much money too. So we are expecting that it is not that highly probable for the China to overcome these challenges just using their own technology. So it will take at least five years or even 10 years. And, but nobody knows because uh, there, there is some strong motivations based on this Chinese patriotism. So I will stop here, but maybe we can share more some generous or some advanced topic on this. Um, sure. Why don't we take that, um, the technological challenges that um, Professor Kwan has raised and maybe think about whether the U.S. policies and the policies that we are, that is being um, targeted towards China are, are efficient or, or the right ones to take. Um, Dr. Kim or Yo uh, or um, anyone would like to, you're, you're, you're shaking your head. Um, Dr. Yo, would you like to take this question? Just to clarify, is the question about where China is at and how the U.S. No, how be? where the the U.S. policies and how the U.S. policy should um, deal with this uh, the the technological innovations that are now very critical in the area of military technology. Yeah, so I mean, I mean that's one of the reasons why we have these export controls to limit uh, China's ability to catch up. I mean, the U.S. really wants to uh, pull forward, push ahead. I mean, one of the concerns I have is something that Professor Kwan, what Professor Kwan had just related to. I mean, we assume in the United States that we're going to slow China down, but China has their own um, nationalist drive where they feel that if, okay, if, if the U.S. and its allies are going to impose these controls on us, we're going to find a way to overcome them. And so you create this unintended consequence where 
um, the Chinese uh, find ways to actually uh, improve their own domestic capacity to uh, to advance their own chips, and so that's the, so they, they won't be able to do it in the next five six years. But let's say ten years down the road, will they be able to catch up? So are we creating in some ways? Uh, our own monster, and and then when China is completely, uh, if they're not dependent anymore on the U.S., then we have a real problem. They can take their technology in a different direction, and that's when we get to uh, Professor Chun's point about you know the regulatory space, where they don't have to be beholden to any kind of regulations because they have their own technology, and they're not they're not relying on the United States. So it does give it should give the U.S. some pause for thought in terms of what kind of uh, consequences uh, our policies are creating, but for the time being, um, you know, this is the direction that the Biden administration has taken. I don't think they're going to reverse uh, reverse course anytime soon. But I do think we have to watch and be careful of what's happening in China. And I know right now the narrative is that they're in an economic downturn, and they may not. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for China to. I mean, the hope is that China will eventually come around and be more cooperative with the U.S., but I don't think we can uh, take anything for granted Granted, right now. Dr. Kim, you were you're I was gonna pick looking at your, the, your my, microphone, yes. Yeah, but actually, Andrew, Dr. Yeo covered, um, you know, really all the same points that I was going to make. The only thing I would add is, you know, I think we're thinking about what are the common sense export controls that are needed. Of course, it does not make sense for the United States to fund China's military advancement. Um, and so there's a real sort of debate about how do you scope these policies so that they make sense for both... Um, for sort of economic reasons, for political reasons, military reasons, but also for our businesses. Um, I guess what I would add is I think we can't be complacent. It's very sobering to hear from the actual technical experts that enough money and time could actually bring China to where, you know, to, to advance China's own technology. And so I think we also need to think ahead and uh, think about how can we do strategic stability? How, do, how can we do arms control in these new frontiers where technologies are employed to take military capabilities in ways that we never thought of. So how are we going to work with China so that we restrain ourselves and other potential rogue actors around the world um, so that we could be in a, in a more stable international order? I think those are questions that we need to give thought to. And maybe, um, Professor Chun, if you could maybe elaborate a little more on maybe, the, you know, Korea's role in all of this. Okay. Uh, basically, the same argument, you know, if you look at the history of RMA, it's innovation, diffusion, and the war. So how to uh, delink this uh, process? So there's, there must be innovation, not just in the area of semiconductor, but if you look at the area of um, AI or quantum computing, I'm not a specialist, but there are reports that China is quite doing well with their own ideas and research uh, capabilities. So it is a matter of time. Uh, so we cannot just uh, totally frustrate China's own indigenous efforts to innovate themselves. So within that time limit or windows opportunity, we have to engage with China. Uh, if we want to weaponize our interdependence, we should not totally decouple from China, but not fuel China to develop too fast. So it's a kind of very delicate <laughs> balance. So uh, uh, and the, the as you said, you know, the alliance assistance policy coordination is very important because China will try to uh, get uh, with many measures to have those advanced technology. Mm. Mr. Revere, you wanted to um, add your comments. Just a, a quick point. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves about the Chinese. If, if I were a member of the Chinese Politburo right now, listening to the debates that are going on in Washington and Tokyo and Seoul and Brussels and, and everywhere else about future restrictions on technology, future limitations to technology that's flowing to me, uh, my instructions to my subordinate colleagues in China would be make the best possible product that you can as quickly as you can, because what's coming down the pike is not something that we look forward to. So let's try to achieve as much independence as we can, as quickly as we can. So let's not kid ourselves about that. Having said that, I, I agree with the points that have been made, uh, that we, we should not go overboard. We don't want to create a, a monster, uh, but the monster is uh, 
to some extent already been created and getting stronger as we speak. Uh, there is an allergy in the United States to international trade agreements, et cetera, as we all know. Uh, that's likely to continue, but maybe uh, this is the issue, uh, COCOM-like restrictions, et cetera, that can motivate uh, people on both sides of the political divide in the United States to work together with our allies and partners around the world to put together some new agreements that keep the, the most delicate and sensitive technologies out of the hands of the Chinese while also keeping the door open to dialogue and cooperation with them and providing, uh, as Korea and some other countries do, uh, a lower level of technology that we don't regard as harmful. Um, I have been told that we have really run out of time. Um, I think we just started, but um, it, but we have. But, I mean, I, I still want to sort of maybe toss down a one final question with very, very quick answers from all of you. We're talking 70 years of alliance, and, and you know, right now, U.S.-Korea alliance is really... Um, wonderful at the moment, but, you know, we've been scared by North Korea, we've been scared by China. Just to, just to sort of think about what the, the concerns and what we do have to be concerned about in the future, what is the one thing, one thing you think would be the biggest threat to this alliance? What could, what could be the reason for a breakup? I said it in my remarks, but I just said domestic politics always comes out as a spoiler, and it's getting the narrative right in the U.S. side. I think if you're, our house is not in order, it's going to be more difficult to sustain alliances because our allies can't really trust us. And the same thing in South Korea as well, too. Um, I think there needs to be a deeper consensus on foreign policy. Domestic politics, yes. Next. Two words. Uh, Trump, and second, oh. money. Uh, I think you know, the Trump point uh, Andrew's just dealt with, money. Uh, if we continue to see this escalation uh, in North Korean weaponry, which would have to be met by a parallel escalation uh, in the alliance's uh, response capabilities, this is going to get more and more and more expensive. And I fear there may come a point at which taxpayers in either South Korea or the United States, or both, start to say, whoa, can we just slow this down a bit and take a long, cold look at where we go from here? Okay. So, Mr. Trump and cash, uh, money. Uh, Mr. I'll, uh, I'll try to top uh, John by uh, offering three words. Uh, the first two words are Donald Trump, for exactly the same reason. getting a consensus here. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, there is no question in my mind that another Trump administration would push this alliance and other U.S. alliances to the brink. We need to be careful about that. The third word that I would use is history, Korean history. The worst things that have happened to Korea and its sovereignty over its history since the late 19th century have usually happened because of a lack of interest or concern on the part of the United States in the Republic of Korea. Uh, whether it's the late 19th century, whether it's 1905, 1910, whether it's 1950 before the Korean War uh, when we drew our security per perimeter and it wasn't included here. Korea has an interest in keeping us as close as possible. Okay. Yes, we're getting... Dr. Kim. Well, with the risk of repeating what everyone else said, <laughs> I also think that domestic politics is always um, one of the biggest challenges for the U.S. ROK alliance. And as I said in my opening remarks, I think really building bipartisan or multipartisan support for the alliance, um, building up advocates for the alliance across parties through the broader public will be incredibly important. Professor Chan. Well, I'm, uh, I'm teaching at the university. I'm teaching uh, this mass international relations theory. Uh, in IR, uh, there is a big debate about human extinction. So we are facing the annihilation of human race. We have just only several decades coming from the transnational threats, such as climate change, nuclear war, or biological uh, problems. So the alliance should uh, contribute to preventing that human annihilation. Mm -hmm. It seems remote, but it's coming. You know, this summer is very hot. Next summer will be hotter. Uh, so the geopolitical traditional competition will be useless in front of that, the real big crisis coming. 
So the bigger picture threat. Yeah, depress all your students, Professor Chan. <laughs> I know. We're scaring a lot of people here today. <laughs> Professor Kwan. Okay. Uh, in semiconductor industry, we are expecting that we will face some kind of this um, limit in technological advance based on the Moore's law. Actually, it has retarded, greatly retarded since 2012 or 2011. So it's been about 10 years. And we don't know that what is the next step to overcome this kind of the grave limit. For that, I would like to say that maybe we can think about the, can we make some another disruptive technology before being disrupted by China. So that's the point I'd like to share the rest. Okay, um, thank you all. I think it is, it is um, that we are looking at threats within and without, but we are also looking at um, ways to uh, resolve these challenges both within and without. And I hope that the next seven years we can work together to be able to resolve these things. For on that note, we'll be concluding this panel. Thank you very much. And that's it for me. Thank you. The 70th anniversary of the USROK Alliance is truly a great occasion. Uh, to mark in this way. And I think the two governments use a lot of slogans and high sounding words to talk about the durability and the determination of this partnership. We always say things like the linchpin, forged in blood, etc. cetera. Uh, but aside from the military and defensive aspects of the alliance, I think we really should marvel at the distance that we've come and at the miraculously successful path that we've traveled. Um, not many, I don't think, would have predicted 70 years ago that we would have preserved peace on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia until today. And who would have foreseen the trajectory of the South Korean economy and the development of the juggernaut that is the ROK growth technology and productivity powerhouse? Uh, we've seen the rise in prosperity of both of our countries, actually, and the rest of the Asia-Pacific region. And we've seen the political transformation of uh, South Korea, of course, into a freewheeling democracy that promotes human potential and flourishing for all its citizens. And just look at the incredible array of Korean cultural exports that are now madly popular around the world. So there is a lot to celebrate, and it is our close and generous partnership, a genuine partnership that made all of this possible. And uh, of course, there have been challenges, and we have been hearing about some of the challenges. Um, I think probably most poignantly for those of us who have worked on uh, uh, U.S.-Korea relations and the peninsular relations over the years, most poignantly is that we um, of course, have been struggling to uh, denuclearize North Korea for quite some time, um, and we still have not accomplished that. But there is so much that we have done. I know Evans Revere is there, and he will remember 1997 when we worked together during the Asian financial crisis um, and really um, were able to do a lot of uh, very good work to kind of make sure that Korea could maintain its trajectory on its uh, economic uh, sort of productivity and technology march. So I think the U.S. ROK Alliance and partnership has really changed the face of the peninsula and the region and the world um, in ways that uh, probably are far beyond what was originally imagined and for the better. And um, a quote, I, it just sticks in my mind all the time. A Korean official once said to me that the good thing about being a U.S. ally was that the U.S. helped its allies get rich, um, which, of course, is not the case if you look to the north of the, of, of the border. Um, and, uh, of course, having rich allies benefits the United States as well. So it was a brilliant strategy and, and it worked. But I think um, it's really important, as is in the title of this um, event that you're holding in, in, in Seoul, uh, to look at 
the future of this partnership and where will we be 70 years from now? So the panels uh, today are looking at kind of near-term future of the alliance in the region on technology issues, geoeconomic issues, security challenges and contingencies. Um, and these are the issues preoccupying policymakers today for sure. Semiconductors, AI, Kim Jong-un's next aggression or China's aspirations to regional hegemony. But I'd like to zoom out even further and ask you to think about how you think this partnership will look in another 70 years, in 2093, near the end of the century. Um, we've just, uh, in the recent past, seen a promising start to maybe closer coordination between Korea and Japan on some of the common challenges that they face. And I think this is very important. It's obviously been widely remarked in, in especially in Washington, but elsewhere as well. Um, but the pace of change in our world is really quickening. And we are going to need to face some realities about the changing nature of our alliance partnership, I believe. Uh, we've long talked about the need for the U.S. to modernize its alliances in Asia to move from this hub and spoke model to something more flexible and durable in structure. And of course, um, it is great that this is happening. Um, of it also does not threaten any one country to move to a model that gives countries more flexibility and more options in their security. So I think um, this is something that is needed, it's totally justified, and it's not threatening. Um, resources are going to need to be more communal. Burdens for security are gonna be more shared, um, both for traditional and non-traditional security threats. And my personal belief is that the latter, the non-traditional security threats, are going to be the ones that are likely to predominate in the coming 70 years. Um, the world economy, I think, is going to be reordered as complex interconnections continue to prove vulnerable to shocks and trade and migration and investment patterns shift. I think developed and developing countries and their economies alike are going to face challenges and big adjustments. And of course, um, this will be difficult politically for, for probably all of us. The current revisions to globalization, the advent of climate change, which has been mentioned, um, and new technologies, including biotechnology, but also AI and other new technologies that are emerging, they are going to change our landscape very fast and it will be very uncomfortable. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, probably politically challenging. The US and its closest friends like the ROK, we need to stick together and support each other um, through these changes. And we need to stress test each other's ideas. Uh, power shifts in the world will mean that most problems become, I think, collective problems and a greater voice in leadership roles for U.S. partners like the Republic of Korea will be called for. The U.S. government should welcome and encourage this, and I do realize that the U.S. government doesn't always welcome outside advice or opinions or seem to welcome them, but it needs to hear the voices of trusted partners, and I urge our Korean friends to be forthright and insistent in registering their ideas and opinions. I think um, I've heard this quote by Winston Churchill mentioned a couple times in recent days, which is a little odd, but the quote about uh, America always does, you can always count on America to do the right thing after it tries everything else. Um, and you know, the America is flexible and it changes quickly, et cetera. But in the fast changing world that we're entering, we don't have room for these kinds of mistakes and errors like we may have had in the past. And so we have to help each other avoid costly mistakes. Um, I think, uh, you know, someone mentioned in the previous panel, constraints, constraints on uh, behavior of various countries um, and that 
frankly, the constraints that haven't been observed in recent years, uh, which have been causing a lot of problems. And we can think of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia here. Um, but I think um, in the new era, there's going to be a need for uh, constraints. And I think uh, Patty Kim mentioned the potential for entering into some new agreements that might constrain uh, various powers in the Asia region and possibly more broadly. And I think this is an area where we could really use a push from our friends uh, to try to set up some better uh, systems of, of control and, and guardrails. Um, and lastly, I want to comment, it's odd that everyone in the previous panel also mentioned this, but uh, domestic politics, I want to comment on that. Um, you know, our two countries are both politically divided, and I think this can impinge on our future security and prosperity, obviously, as well as diminish prospects for our global leadership. The challenges that we will face in the future are too complex for us to be able to afford these kinds of divisions. So we have to figure out how to reward responsible actions and problem solving and compromise so that we can be positioned to lead together in the way the world is going to need us to through these challenges. The wild swings in policies that we see that only serve uh, domestic politics uh, will corrode our authority and our leadership, and we cannot afford that. But I think most of all, and I'll just end with this, we should keep being generous and keep being honest with each other. And we will certainly need this alliance, this friendship, to last for another 70 years as we confront all of these difficult challenges. So while I didn't mention specifics about semiconductor, technology export controls, you know, how to compete with China in my comments here. I am mindful of all of those challenges, but I do very much uh, I'm interested in the comments that were made about human extinction and all of the other challenges that we're going to be facing. And I think those are going to come up on us, even as North Korea looms and as China looms, I think these challenges are going to come up on us very, very quickly and certainly within the next 70 years. And I hope we will be able to stand together and address them. And I urge our wise uh, Korean counterparts to, to give us uh, more and more forceful advice uh, so that we can avoid uh, making some of the errors that we've seen uh, in the recent past. Thank you very much for having me. I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, Susan Thornton, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai uh, China Center at Yale Law School and a longtime uh, former diplomat at the uh, U.S. State Department. So thank you for that uh, very insightful um, overview of the alliance and where we might be headed and where we should be headed. Now, we'll begin the second session. Um, I'm going to introduce, I mean, we have six very distinguished pan panel members, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction. And I was uh, told by the organizers that uh, they would give their like short pieces of um, prepared speeches. Um, I would say maybe not over five minutes, please, um, because we do want to come back uh, to have some uh, discussions on what is very, very important topic. Um, let me begin by thanking President Park in -Guk and the Che Institute for this very timely uh, organization of the uh, of this conference. So um, we're we're going to be talking about the alliance, but not in the traditional sense, because when we're talking about the U.S.-Korea alliance, it's always usually about North Korea. It's about the Korean Peninsula. Right? But since the advent of the Yoon Song Yeol uh, government, it's about our global outreach, um, expansion of what we can do, carrying this alliance into the global context and certainly into the Indo Pacific uh, region with a lot of uh, implications, including uh, Taiwan. So I'd be very um, interested to hear what, what some of you might have to say. So 
please uh, save the cl cl uh, claps until the last uh, introduction. So I will give you the introduction of all six panelists first. Um, right next to me to the left is um, Professor uh, Dr. Lee Jung-min, who is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. And he's my, of course, my longtime former uh, colleague at Yonsei University's uh, Graduate School of International Studies. Um, next to Chung Min Lee is um, Tanvi Madan, who is a senior fellow uh, in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings uh, Institute. And then to her left is Dr. Ma Sang Yun, who is a professor of international relations at the Catholic University of Korea, and he's formerly, he was a uh, director general for the strategy at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And then uh, to his left is Ryan Haas, Haas um, who is a director of the John Thornton China Center and the Chen Fu and Cecilia Yeo Ku Chair in Taiwan Studies at Brookings uh, Institute. And to his left, is Melanie uh, Sison, um, pardon my pronunciations if I'm getting it wrong, um, who is a fellow in the in foreign policy program's Strobe Talbot Center for Security uh, Strategy and Technology, where she um, researches the use of the uh, arms, arms forces in the international politics. And finally, uh, we have Dr. Kim Han Gwon, who is a professor um, of, of the uh, Center for Chinese Studies at IFANS, Institute for of uh, Foreign Affairs and uh, National uh, Security. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn to Dr. Lee Jung-min. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back at the uh, Che Academy. Let me thank Ambassador Park in gook and to see my old friends, Evan and Son Jie, whom I've known for a long time, uh, Kim Sang-han, the only problem that Chung -un, the only problem that I have with Chung Un moderating this session is because he knows everything what I'm about to say. So <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun since we've been friends for like 30 odd years. Because of the time limit, let me just focus on a few key trends. The first is I think as we see with Kim Jong Un's visit with Putin that's going on as we speak. This really is a new Axis. I don't want to call this the axis of evil, but I was trying to find a nice word for evil, but I really couldn't find one. Uh, but if you look at the Eurasian map, it's fairly, I guess, new that you have Russia, China, North Korea cooperating across the WMD spectrum. And so I think this is going to become one of the key hallmarks of our security map over the next you know, five plus years. <clears throat> the second big trend that I see is the so-called era of long peace that was the Cold War is coming to an end. It, it has ended. And I believe that Asia is entering into what I would call a long arc of competition, conflict, and major crises. I do not foresee major wars on the Korean Peninsula, but I do not believe, for example, that there will be sustainable peace over the next you know, 10, 15 years. The last time Asia had a major war was in Vietnam. And then the, the last time we had a major naval, I guess, clash was in World War II. And so if you look at the, a Taiwan contingency, whether it's a blockade, a quarantine, low intensity conflict, major inv invasion, et cetera, we're going to see the first biggest naval engagement between the US and China and I am quite sure that the Japanese will be involved. As you know, the southernmost tip of the Japanese island is only about 110 kilometers off the coast of Taiwan. And so for the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, a Taiwan contingency is almost automatically a Japanese contingency. The third major driver that I see happening is we're entering into a new era of an arms race driven by AI-driven platforms. We're talking about hypersonics and lasers and rail guns and so forth. But most of us, especially those who are not tech savvy like most of us in this room, 
focus on the tipping points. In other words, the spear, what you see on CNN or what others basically say. But I think the big change will come in the unseen aspects of this AI revolution. For example, within, I would say, five, 10 years, many of the critical, I guess, defense-related intelligence assessments at the bottom level will be done by AI. And so you're, you're going to have a sea change in how the military bureaucracy really functions. And this goes down the entire food chain, including the military industrial complex. By 2047, some 40% of US naval fleets will be basically unmanned platforms. So why would you need a US Naval Academy or a South Korean Naval Academy to train future officers? So it's not just a man-machine interface that's going to become problematic. It's budgeting, it's doctrine, it's force planning, it's intelligence. It is going to change the entire fabric of how governments function on the national security platform. And I think Taiwan is going to become the first litmus test because as much as, as bad as the Ukrainian war is, it's not in our neighborhood and it is not involving China. And so that I think will become crucial over the, over the years. My final point is for South Korea, and here we have Kim Song-han um, who served as the first NSC advisor to President Yoon. And I think it was under his watch that the nuclear consultative group idea was formed, which I think was a major way of uh, improving Korea's deterrence. But I think that whatever happens around Taiwan or the South China Sea, any future Korean government, left or right or center, is going to find it extremely difficult to be involved directly militarily. But there will be intense pressure from the Americans, I think, on a number of points, and I'll stop here. One, they would at the very least uh, ask the Koreans to support UNC rear operations. President Yoon mentioned the importance of UNC rear. Uh, I think he was the first Korean president to do so, and I think he was right in saying that. But if the Korean Navy is able to support UNC operations on a fairly sustainable basis, you need much deeper collaboration between the US, Japan, and Korea than you have today. Second, if there is a major Chinese operation against Taiwan, at the very least, I think the Americans will say, South Korea should at least support maritime countermeasures. Now, that's something that the Koreans have not done. We've participated in RIMPAC and other uh, uh, exercises, but this is where the rubber meets the road. And so I think going forward, some of our time between the US and the ROK and our Japanese friends should be focused on how are we going to really actually respond to a series of contingencies in Taiwan. Like Japan, you know, 90% of our trade depends on maritime sea lanes and 100% of our oil and natural gas goes through these choke points. So let me stop there, and I'm saying that things will get a lot worse before they get better. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Lee. Um, as moderator, I usually make comments after each like presentations, but uh, it makes us look engaged. <laughs> I'm going to save that uh, this time around because, because of the time limit. So let me now turn to Dr. Madan. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking Ambassador Park and the Che Institute and my colleague Andrew Yu as well. Um, I thought what I'd do is just make some brief comments about the evolving U.S. approach to architecture in the region uh, and ROK's potential role in the Indo-Pacific as part of this U.S. strategy. Uh, over the last year plus, there's been an uh, understandable focus on a Taiwan contingency uh, because of developments uh, during this period, and of course the high stakes involved. However, as recent incidents in the South China Sea have demonstrated, that is not the only potential flashpoint in the Indo-Pacific, or as North Korea regularly reminds us. Uh, moreover, there are a range of regional issues in the security domain or related to it uh, that need to be tackled in the region. Uh, China's assertive behavior is, of course, of significant concern, but it's not the only challenge. Um, 
existing mechanisms uh, have been very important in dealing with challenges over these last few years, but it's also become clear that they have not been sufficient in and of themselves. And the Biden administration has made clear that the U.S. has neither the ability uh, nor the desire to address these challenges alone. Uh, thus, the administration has increasingly invested in what, and my colleague Andrew mentioned this earlier, invested in what it's called the lattice work of American alliances and partnerships and coalitions. One can also think of this as a network or a spider web approach uh, to partnerships in the region. Uh, via this approach, Washington has continued to engage with regional organizations, for example, ASEAN uh, and the East Asia Summit, but it has also deepened bilateral alliances and partnerships and invested in or created issue or interest-based coalitions uh, or minilaterals, for example, the Quad, AUKUS, or the CHIPFO Alliance. Uh, cooperation via these mechanisms involves consultations, coordination, uh, and operational uh, collaboration. Uh, the objective is to shape a favorable balance of power and influence in the region. That has involved two lines of effort. One line of effort as a, a U.S. as a regional security provider. Uh, that means enhancing U.S. and a regional capability to detect, to de deter, to deny, and to respond to challenges. The second line of effort uh, has been as a regional solutions provider, trying to offer global uh, public goods and higher quality alternatives. Uh, I think the U.S. has done better on the first than the second, but it is a work in progress. Uh, that phase of kind of creation and investment is now being followed by a phase of consolidation and integration, focused on the deepening of bilaterals and minilaterals, uh, but also on linking the various nodes of the network. For example, we've seen this in the case of the historic uh, U.S.-Korea uh, Japan trilateral recently, but also the US, Australia, Japan, Philippines defense dialogue that was held uh, as well a, a few months ago. The US, of course, is not the only actor that is following such an approach. Indeed, countries in the region, other than the US, are deepening their own bilateral ties with each other, and some are even taking the lead in creating new minilaterals or coalitions. Uh, these efforts are most often complementary to the US approach. But in certain cases, they also reflect certain uncertainty about the U.S. And we talked about uh, the domestic political uncertainty, and that, I think, is a front, uh, a front and center in allies and partners' mind in the region. South Korea is already part of this effort via its own and uh, through U.S. initiatives as well uh, in the Indo-Pacific, along with deepening uh, the trilateral uh, building on the, uh, uh, sorry, build, uh, along with deepening the U.S. ROK bilateral, building on the U.S. ROK Japan trilateral, and discussing respective China approaches uh, with the U.S., there are additional opportunities for Seoul, including one, uh, deepening bilateral ties with other U.S. allies in both Asia and Europe as well. Second, enhancing its regional solutions provider role through Seoul's ties with other regional countries, deploying its diplomatic, defense, economic, and technological capabilities, and coordinating this with the U.S. and other like-minded partners, whether that's in the Pacific, in Southeast Asia, or even in South Asia. Third, developing a broader and deeper relationship with evolving U.S. partners such as India. And fourth, connecting with existing coalitions or minilaterals uh, such as the Quad. I'm just going to briefly mention on the Quad and India a couple of points and areas I think uh, that we uh, can collaborate uh, uh, more kind of significantly, whether that is in terms of thinking about US, the US approach in the Indo-Pacific uh, or in terms of, for example, uh, ties between uh, Korea and India for that matter. I will just briefly uh, take the minute that I have left to do that and say that while there's been some discussion, some discussions, for example, on some, a, a mini lateral like the Quad, the Australia, India, Japan, uh, US grouping, there have been suggestions of expanding its membership. Uh, members thus far have been resistant to the idea. Nonetheless, uh, there are there's significant opportunity for greater cooperation between the Quad, uh, quad and ROK uh, at the Quad level, at the Quad Plus level, as well as the sub Quad uh, level. And I think this approach, particularly, for example, uh, Korea engaging with the working groups of the Quad, also allows Seoul to pick and choose uh, 
uh, which parts of the agenda items of the Quad it wants to, it has the comfort level, the desire and the willingness to join. Uh, some of the working groups that might uh, be of interest, including the critical and emerging technologies uh, uh, agenda item, uh, resilient supply chains, there's a regional infrastructure working group, maritime security, uh, cyber security, uh, green shipping, uh, as well as health security and disaster management uh, and response. There's also a significant uh, uh, cooperate, uh, cooperation potential in the Quad Plus area. We've already seen, for example, in some of the maritime exercises, uh, there is a, a kind of a Australia, India, Japan, US anti-submarine warfare exercise that has included Canada in the past, uh, and uh, ROK joined the last couple of years as well. There's much more scope for that. I think there's also scope uh, for the, uh, South Korea to join what the Quad is already doing in terms of coordinating positions as they go into regional and multilateral forms. Uh, and finally, uh, the broadening and deepening of sub-Quad links. Uh, there's been some discussion of potential uh, uh, new trilaterals with Korea and some of the Quad partners, but I would say this has to be on the basis uh, more uh, than trilaterals on strengthening bilaterals, particularly the Australia-Korea uh, bilateral, as well uh, as the Korea-India uh, bilateral. Uh, President Yoon was just in India. He said there's immense potential uh, for linking up and synchronizing India and Korea's Indo-Pacific strategies. And now what we need to do is take, uh, and uh, what he said is need to take that potential to, to performance. And I think some of the areas you'll see that in uh, is the strategic consultations area, uh, the defense industrial cooperation area, um, economic security, uh, commercial ties, as well as people-to-people -people connectivity. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, next, um, Dr. Ma. Thank you very much. Uh, Tanvi, Tanvi, sorry, uh, touched up on the issue of uh, regional architecture. I will uh, elaborate my thinking on that. Uh, subject as well. Uh, United States have uh, pushed for the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy ever since 2017, and it also wanted South Korea play an active role within the uh, Indo-Pacific framework. Uh, the, our previous government uh, was somehow uh, not really forthcoming in responding to that, and uh, with the change of our government, uh, we uh, published our own Indo-Pacific strategy uh, last December, and in the previous uh, Camp David uh, summit, uh, we have, uh, you know, pledged uh, trilateral uh, consultation and cooperation, uh, not just in uh, Korea the Peninsula, but also in the Indo-Pacific uh, region and and beyond. So now South Korea. Uh, very actively uh, uh, began to participate in the in the Pacific uh, cooperation. I would like to uh, exp uh, draw your attention to the reasons why uh, for this uh, South Korea's policy shift. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, great imp interest in the uh, safety of uh, in the Pacific region. Because of our, uh, we are we are an open trading uh, uh, nation, which requires the uh, safety in the uh, maritime domain. But that fact itself doesn't really uh, explains the policy shift, because uh, the the necessity of uh, uh, maritime security has been always the same and cannot be the variable that explains our policy shift. What has changed, in my view, uh, is first the perception of the content of the strategic cooperation with the United States. Under the uh, previous administration, cooperation with the United States was emphasized, but the emphasis was on uh, the side of the dialogue with North Korea. Uh, under the current UN administration, however, the emphasis was on securing and deterrence against North Korean nuclear threat. The realistic judgment that de denuclearization are difficult uh, in the uh, short term goal uh, to achieve through dialogue with, the, with North Korea was made. So the policy priority 
was somehow uh, shift to the deterrence, deterring North Korea's uh, nuclear threats. And to this end, our uh, cooperation with the United States and uh, the, the question of credibility, alliance credibility, is being very much highlighted. And uh, uh, alliance, uh, the strengthening of the alliance and uh, its uh, credibility uh, means we need to take a, a much more clear stance between the Washington and Beijing. The second reason I think is related to the concern about the possibility of diplomatic isolation. Uh, United States was and has been actively organizing a mini lateral network uh, across the region uh, by working closely with a variety of allies and partners and expected South Korea uh, to take part in. Uh, but uh, uh, previous, our, our previous policies very much centered on the, the necessity of uh, uh, coping with the threat from North Korea. And uh, that somehow uh, uh, fostered a sense of uh, same bed and different dreams among the allies. To strengthen the alliance, therefore, it was quite necessary to, to restore alliance coordination in South Korea's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy was an expression of its willingness to do so. The third element uh, that may have to be pointed out is uh, to changing South Korean perception of China. Uh, well, probably 2016, a thought retaliation, so-called, was pretty, uh, pretty critical in that uh, you know, uh, South Korean perception of China or China threat. Uh, China's aggressive and uh, egocentric foreign behavior and assertiveness have significantly reduced South Korean public opinion's favorability uh, toward China. And this trend has been particularly pronounced among the younger generation now. And this shift in public opinion has uh, had an uh, indirect impact on policy, I think. Well, uh, we have therefore uh, shifted toward uh, the regional uh, coordination and regional co uh, strengthened regional cooperation with the United States in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but I think there are some areas that we can develop further. Uh, still, uh, or to date, uh, the uh, the multi uh, minilateral uh, cooperation in the region is very much U.S. centered and U.S. mediated, uh, and there is, I think, uh, there is a need to actively develop minilateral cooperation framework among U.S. allies and, and partners uh, that do not directly involve the United States. So uh, there, are, I think, th there are. Uh, possibilities that we can develop uh, minilateralism with U.S. or or end without U.S. that will, I think, uh, fulfill uh, the American uh, conception of uh, uh, creating the lattice of uh, uh, lattice work of uh, alliance and partners in the region. Uh, in that regard. Uh, I've been just back from uh, Australia yesterday, and in that regard, I think a Korea-Australia uh, cooperation is pretty, pretty critical. And we can uh, think of the uh, necessity of uh, Korea-Australia and plus coordination. Uh, well, if, uh, for example, well, we can uh, form based on the U.S. and uh, I'm sorry, Korea-Australia, uh, uh, you know, cooperation, we can form a diplomatic or, or security consultation group uh, with other uh, Indo-Pacific regions, such as Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia, Korea, and uh, Australia happen to be a part of uh, MICTA, which is a, a middle power consultation, uh, you know, net, uh, platform, which have been, uh, which have not been very visible these days, uh, but we, we can somehow coordinate uh, Asia, well, Indo Pacific uh, centered uh, MICTA uh, breakout group uh, so that we can reach out to the, the Indonesia, which is a very uh, potentially uh, powerful player in the region. Uh, and uh, 
by reaching out to that country, uh, we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, somehow uh, favorably affect the regional dynamics between, uh, you know, uh, Korea, uh, between uh, Beijing and, and, and Washington playing out in the region. Uh, I will stop here, and if there's uh, more uh, uh, things to take, uh, I'll, I'll do it later. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ma. I'll, I will now turn to Dr. Ryan. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Ambassador Park and to the Che Institute for, for bringing us all together. I have a confession to make at the outset, which is that my main motivation for being here is to listen to these brilliant minds, not to speak myself. But I understand that my price of admission for doing so is to share a few thoughts. And so the, the few thoughts that I'm going to speak on are the contribution that the Alliance can make to a future Taiwan contingency. The main point that I hope that I leave you with is that now is the time for Washington and Seoul to begin quietly converging around common expectations for how we would respond to a, a future contingency in the Taiwan Strait. But to make progress, I think Washington is going to have to accept that Seoul has legitimate reasons for wanting to proceed quietly and cautiously in these discussions. At the same time, I encourage our, our friends in Seoul to embrace the fact that they will have a role to play uh, in any future crisis in the Taiwan Strait. There has been a lot of uh, noise recently in the press, particularly in the Western press, about Taiwan issues and the prospect of war. We've just heard uh, Professor Lee talk about uh, a crisis as a near inevitability in the Taiwan Strait. I certainly don't subscribe to that view, but let me just be clear. The purpose of American policy is not to win a war, it's to avoid one. That is the first point that I, I would really like to stress. At the same time, I think that prudence demands that we prepare for the worst even as we hope for the best. And in that spirit, there are a few steps that we can begin taking now uh, that would help converge our expectations around how we would each respond. I will put three of them on the table and happy to expand upon this uh, in discussion. The first, I think it would be helpful for both sides to begin conducting analytic exchanges on the most proximate risks to stability in the Taiwan Strait, as well as the most likely triggers for instability in the Taiwan Strait. This would help us build a, a, a common framework for understanding and anticipating events, but it would also help us build a, a common vocabulary and a common lens for being able to diagnose issues as they develop. The, the second issue is to begin discussions quietly on the question of under what circumstances South Korea could declare support for USFK to exercise strategic flexibility to respond to a cross-strait contingency. As a matter of alliance health, it's going to be important for both sides to have a common understanding of what conditions would need to be present for Seoul to support U.S. forces operating outside of the peninsula. This is a conversation that needs to happen now, not in the heat of a crisis. And then third and relatedly, I think it would be helpful uh, for both sides to begin developing a continuum of military contributions that could be made available to respond to a crisis should one ever emerge. So these, these types of steps constitute the what of alliance coordination for a potential Taiwan contingency. It's also important for us to think about the how, how we would do this, how we would coordinate on these sensitive questions going forward. And I think it's important for... Uh, the United States side to keep focus on the substance of the coordination, not the symbolism of it. And so there needs to be discretion. Uh, there needs to be privacy uh, in efforts to, to advance these conversations. I think there probably uh, would be usefulness and a channel that could be developed that could include representatives from each country's defense, diplomatic, economic, and intelligence services. This collection of officials would allow for uh, coordination to proceed in a holistic manner. Uh, with var various equities that would be taken into consideration. So let me just close here uh, by saying that I think it is in Washington and Seoul's mutual self-interest now to begin making all possible efforts uh, to preserve peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, but prepare, prepare for the possibility that uh, it could be disrupted. Should a crisis emerge, though, we as an alliance must be prepared to respond collectively. American and South Korean interests would be too deeply implicated for either side uh, to sit out a crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Haas. Um, now, Melanie Sasson. Well, good afternoon and thank you. Um, it's very nice to, to be here with you, very special, in fact, to be here on this special occasion. So my thanks to the Che Institute and to the Brookings team that coordinated it as well. Um, 
I'm going to focus my remarks on the changed military dynamics in the region and to ask us to think together a bit about what those changes do and don't mean um, for the role of the United States. As Ryan mentioned, within the United States, there's real concern about the uh, circumstance surrounding uh, the Taiwan question right now, and in particular, about the military balance over the strait. And this is a reaction in part to um, China's more assertive behaviors. It's also a reaction to the fact that the military balance has definitively shifted and in ways that do not advantage the United States and its allies and partners particularly. And so for understandable reasons, there's been a lot of focus on U.S. defense strategy in particular and on what the United States Department of Defense can and should do given these changes and given these circumstances. Um, the United States does maintain the best equipped and most lethal fighting force, the most lethal global fighting force in the world. Um, but even that military can't solve Taiwan's military problem. Um, and this is because there are real and significant operational challenges that the U.S. military confronts when it thinks about operating in a Taiwan contingency of pretty much any level of intensity. Uh, and those challenges are primarily three. Um, they are distance, they are vulner vulnerability, and they are politics. Um, a Taiwan contingency of any kind would happen 7,000 miles of ocean away from the continental United States, and there is no way around that fact. Um, right now, the United States military simply can't support the demands of such a conflict um, over those 7,000 miles of ocean. We don't have enough capacity to get all of the things we would need into the theater. We're vulnerable to PLA capabilities once uh, on our way trying to get those capacities into theater. And then of course we're vulnerable once we're there. Um, again, this would, this would affect any level of intensity of operation that the United States military would need to maintain. It would require the military to overcome contestation in every mission domain. Um, and direct operations would be entirely within range of the PLA rocket force, which is estimated at the low end to have roughly 2,000 precision missiles. And for perspective, the U.S. military right now has in its roster about 400, probably less than that, um, of, of those same kinds of long-range precision fires, which would be involved in any kind of um, shooting contingency. And those 400 um, are not in East Asia. They are distributed um, elsewhere as well. So it would, it would be a challenge to get them into theater in the first place. And even if we were able to get all of that capability into the theater and we were able to use every round, um, realistically, we should expect to destroy only about 40 targets, um, which would, would clearly not be sufficient given the kinds of scenarios that we're talking about. Um, the United States military faces similar problems with other assets and resources. Fuel is a good example. Right now, the Department of Defense only has enough fuel transport tankers to address about 10% of what good estimates indicate would be required in a contingency. Um, and that capability would have to fuel assets across all of the military services, not just one or the other. So there would be real opportunity costs and choices to be made and trade-offs. Um, under the current conditions, military span spending and advances in military technology won't solve these problems. They can't solve these problems of distance or of vulnerability or of politics, um, much less of the effects of all of them on overall U.S. military capacity. So what this means is that the United States military can continue to contribute to regional peace and stability, but of course we can't guarantee it and we can't do it alone. Now, that doesn't mean that we ought to do nothing. We shouldn't, after all, expect U.S. military posture and its alliance relationships to remain static in an environment that has changed in important ways. But we all should be clear that it's not going to be possible for the United States to recapture the kind of military dominance over China that it had uh, that it had before. So the goal of U.S. military adjustment, adjustments, I think, um, should should be to ensure not only that we and our allies and partners and friends of Taiwan have a shared understanding of our respective roles and responsibilities if there is a crisis, but also to ensure that China can't strike a surprise blow that prevents the United States from responding militarily if our leaders determine it's in our national interest to do so. So this will require, among other things, having resiliency and redundancy in U.S. military resources and assets throughout the region. 
Now, um, I'm sure it won't surprise you to know that the Department of Defense, of course, would very much like to be able to pre-position materiel of all kinds and have guaranteed entry and complete liberty of operations at all bases and access points. Um, but even short of that, some meaningful steps can be taken. And I think what Ryan has described, for example, charts a, charts a steady and sensible path forward. The United States also can, we can do our part and we can um, reaffirm our one China policy and leave no confusion that the goal of that policy is to maintain conditions under which the disagreement between Beijing and Taipei can be resolved peacefully. Toward that end, it behooves all of us uh, to remember that an increase in Chinese military capability doesn't mean that there's an equal and opposite decrease in deterrence. Deterrence isn't a military equation. It's a human calculation about costs and benefits and risks. And there are tools available other than the military that can and should be used to influence this calculation in Beijing. It is, for example, an important signal for regional allies and partners to express their interest in peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait. Um, and it's important especially because doing so indicates a willingness to tolerate the costs of Chinese unhappiness. This makes it a strong signal. Um, and should suggest to China that even if not imposed militarily, there is a risk of consequence for an unprovoked use of force. So in sum, um, the military balance has changed. Uh, the operational challenges are real, and they should inform us that there is no purely military solution to this problem. Um, but still, we also would do well to remember that the United States, together with good allies and partners and friends, can pursue a strategy that keeps the risk of war very low, um, uh, knowing, of course, that such a strategy will not be cost-free. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Sison. And finally, Dr. Kim han Guan. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. And uh, I'd like to also express my thanks to Che and Brookings institutions, as well as Ambassador Park for organizing this meaningful special conference in an appropriate time. Uh, today, I'd like to mainly discuss the Taiwan Strait issues with South Korean perspective and the US-China strategic competition in the region by emphasizing two points. First, uh, I believe we should more focusing on uh, Chinese economic challenges and Chinese domestic, domestic political issues when we discuss uh, the Taiwan Strait, issue, Taiwan Strait issues. And second, uh, I'd like to argue my major concerns in terms of Iraq-US alliance. It is the weak point of the uh, Iraq-Japan relations as well as Iraq-US-Japan trilateral cooperation caused by South Korean divided public opinions at the moment. In recent years, many, many scholars and experts have offered various possible scenarios for China's invading, blockading, and quarantine Taiwan or in part of it. It is true that during the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party of China, CPC, top leaders of CPC concretely expressed their strong will to unify Taiwan, including a possibility to use military means. However, if we see China's current struggling economic situation, as well as still an obvious differences of military capabilities between the US and China, probably President Xi Jinping in the near future might not to take a risk to military confrontation with the United States caused by China's attempting to occupy Taiwan in haste. Indeed, with intensifying US-China strategic competition, the CPC leaders has seriously concerned about blowback of the US and its allies and partner countries whenever China announces messages and revises Taiwan unification plans. Uh, for example, as the uh, Atlantic Council recently pointed out precisely, if a new Taiwan Strait crisis occurs, the G7 would review their experiences of conducting sanctions programs against Russia and would bring harsher sanctions, possibly including financial sanctions, to impose on China. At the same time, 
US and its allies and partner countries would make a huge effort to design harsher but minutely targeted sanctions to reduce expected shocks over the global economy as well as their own economies respectively. Therefore, China for the moment is trying to coerce and to introduce Taiwan to follow China's way of peaceful unification. Beijing is also showing Washington its strong will to sovereign Taiwan and sending um, warning messages to Seoul and Tokyo. Against the backdrop of the current situation of Taiwan Strait under the US-China strategic competition, I would like to focus more on the domestic concern of Xi Jinping's leadership rather than on all-out warfare scenarios for a unification. Because if China's economic situation is continuously going downward, or an unexpected domestic political backlash is taking place. There is a possibility that Beijing could possibly occupy or blockade the Matsu near Xiamen or the Kinmen Island close to the Fuzhou in order to turn the Chinese people's attentions to outside. And also, uh, probably there are two other islands that Taiwan controls uh, could be China's targets. First, the Taiping Island in South China Sea. Second, the Pratas Islands located between Hong Kong and the Luzon Strait. Besides the Matsu and Kinmen Island, probably we should also watch carefully to China's approach to these outlier islands. On the other hand, many experts point out that if a, China, a Taiwan Strait crisis occurs by a Chinese belligerent acts, the coordination among the US and its allies and partner countries would be a critical key to success of any possible collective sanctions against China. In the same manner, I would like to point out uh, the important role of ROC, US, Japan, trilateral cooperation in the Taiwan Strait issues and in the Indo-Pacific regions. Secondly, I also would like to point out that the weak point of the uh, rock japan uh, reconciliation recently and also uh, rock us japan trilateral cooperation. As we know, to cope with any possible Taiwan Strait crisis, ROC US Japan trilateral uh, regional security cooperation will be expected to take a critical role. The Yun Song Yeol administration, in order to extend the deterrence of North Korean nuclear and missile threat, has consolidated ROC US alliance as well as improved relations with Japan since its inauguration. And the Yun administration's policy toward the US and Japan have definitely contributed to promote the trilateral cooperation. However, we should carefully review the point that the stability and sustainability of improved the uh, rock japan relations and the trilateral cooperation. And it uh, will be tested and changes, possibly changes, due to the result of the South Korean domestic political issues, such as coming uh, important national elections. According to the result of the opinion polls conducted by Mail Business Newspaper in South Korea in March 2023, 67% of the South Korean population supported for the improved rock japan relations. However, about two months later, another result of opinion polls was reported. The poll was conducted by South Korean Hanguk Ilbo and Japanese Yomiuri Shimbun in ROC and Japan simultaneously in May to, uh, 2023 and asked the evaluation of ROC Japan relations. The result says 80% of Japanese people positively evaluated the improvement of the bilateral relations, while 47% of South Korean people answered positively and 49.5% answered negatively. 
Furthermore, South Korean Yonam News uh, conducted an opinion poll in South Korea early this month. One of the questions was, is the result of Camp David Trilateral Summit would be helpful for the security of the Korean Peninsula? 45.1% answered yes, and 44.8% said no. In my opinion, current South Korean public opinion regarding to Iraq, Japan relations and the trilateral cooperation is clearly divided. And depending on the result of the coming elections with the, uh, this kind of divided South Korean public opinion, probably South Korea's policy toward Japan and the trilateral cooperation can be shifted. Uh, for that reason, it is also my major concern for when we talk about ROC-US alliance. It is definitely necessary the trilateral cooperation when we're dealing with the Taiwan Strait issues and Indo-Pacific strategy. However, the division of Korean public uh, opinion in the South Korea society could be a weak point of stability and sustainability of rock Japan relations as well as rock US Japan trilateral cooperation, uh, which uh, I think it is a major point we should watch very carefully in the future, and also further discussion is needed for the stability of rock US alliance as well as the trilateral cooperation in the region. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Dr. Kim. Um, for simplicity sake, I will. I have three questions, um, and maybe not all, but like one or two people can answer each question, and then in the end, hopefully, everyone will have had a had a say uh, before we close it. Yesterday uh, lunch, I had a very uh, interesting luncheon with a KAIST uh, professor who's who's an AI uh, specialist. And uh, he was saying that, you know, the warfare, and I know, Dr. Lee, this is your sort of area of the like, revolutionary, you know, war, in re uh, warfare. He was saying that we've gone through, you know, number of stages in, in the way the wars are conducted, trench warfare in the World War I, and then the atomic bomb, World War II, Vietnam War, special forces, and then the Afghan war, you know, drones are being used. And he's saying that in the, in the future, it will be AI, right? And he very interestingly, he 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 um, he actually talked about like new Atchison line, new Atchison line based on the AI network and platforms. Uh, that's how the 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 region will be uh, divided. So um, I just wanted to because we keep talking about the Taiwan Straits crisis and the warfare um, looming large. How does this technology uh, come in? I know in the morning session that this was also maybe talked about a little bit. So maybe, maybe Dr. Lee, would you like to take that question? Yeah, I'll be very brief, uh, uh, Chung Hun, and thank you for that great question. <clears throat> I think if you look at what's happening in the Ukrainian war, it is what I would call the beginning of Star Wars, in the sense that this is the real first war where you have, for example, 80% of the satellite imagery is downloaded by, by private companies. And so one of the biggest changes in a future Taiwan contingency is the role of private companies in terms of delivering on-time intelligence. And that's something that we've never really faced before. And so how can South Korea, the US, and Japan, for example, plus Australia, coordinate their intelligence with the help of these large tech giants for example, Elon Musk had a veto on whether Zelensky could use his satellites to conduct operations against Russia, which he vetoed. So this is one man, a very rich guy. Uh, so that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. The second point is that all of these AI-driven platforms are basically piecemeal. They're not really integrated into a fighting for example, command and, 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 and control structure. And so until that day comes, which will take about 10, 20 years, I think what we will see is bits and pieces of AI mixed with traditional and non-traditional military efforts so that there will be a more of a mixed bag 
rather than switching completely into, for example, Iron Man era wars. And you see that application in Taiwan crisis as well? Yes. For, for example, when I was talking to people from Raytheon, they said if a war breaks out in Taiwan tomorrow, and this was last year, they counted how many missiles could Raytheon actually provide to U.S. forces from its inventory worldwide. Mm. And they said it would last four days. Mm. So ramping up production is much more important than having these really snazzy AI-driven weapons. Yeah. So that's going to be another key uh, issue that we face. Dr. Haas? I'm just Ryan, but thank you. Uh, I wanted to offer two two points of context to to this question because I think it's really important that we 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 ground this. The first is that the United States and China are significantly ahead of every other country in the world in terms of AI applications and and um, employment. The second is that both the United States and China are deeply anxious about how the other is employing and using. AI in its, in its warfighting capability. At Brookings, we've been running a, a track two dialogue or track 1.5 dialogue with Chinese counterparts on this very question, the role of AI in national security for the past three years. One of the, the learnings that we've taken away from this is that the Chinese are profoundly concerned that we are further ahead than they are by a significant margin and that we are going to use AI in, in ways that are threatening and, 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 and exacerbating of their vulnerabilities. We have the same concerns in reverse. So there's this mirroring dynamic that's taking place, and it's causing both sides to push further and faster um, without any real sustained government-to-government -government dialogue between the United States and China. The, the only channel that exists for discussing these issues in a national security context is the one between Brookings and its, its Chinese counterpart, which is somewhat frightening. Um, but hopefully, in, in the coming months, we'll be able to make progress, elevate this conversation to uh, a government dialogue where it deserves to be, so that both sides can begin to really sort of ground uh, each other's views and assumptions based upon uh, an accurate understanding of where the other is. Okay. Uh, thank you. My second question is, um, everyone knows that the United States has the world's you know, most powerful Navy. Um, you know, no question about that. But I also understand that China is printing warships out of its factory lines uh, at a speed unheard of. Um, whilst in the U.S., I understand that, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the docks, our harbor docks for maintenance and so on are closing down. Uh, quite, quite a few have closed down, which presents a concern. So do you see the gap closing, particularly in the Indo-Pacific uh, area? And if so, why should China you know, start a war now when, you know, when it can wait a few more years and, and really close the gap in the maritime sense? Sure. Um so there's no question when we think about the advances in terms of not just quality but quantity that China has made, and particularly with its naval assets. Um, but quantity alone doesn't mean everything. Um, that said, um, the United States does have challenges um, with um, supporting its current Navy, um, much less building it out further. Some of that does have to do with shipyards. Um, you see the United States creating relationships with other countries in part because of that fact, um, not only because of that, but as a way of um, invigorating mutual interest and attention to the naval character of the Indo-Pacific region, and that's all for the good. Um, some of those things are going to take a long time to emerge. Um, building these platforms that the United States prefers that are very highly technologized um, and have a lot of um, tonnage and not as much in terms of quantity, but um, sheer mass and, and the ability to transport and maneuver large other pieces of capability around take years um, in the making. So I would just add to that that this is a place actually where those AI-enabled technologies, where they are in their current stage of development, actually can be really useful, not as we prepare for a war fight, but as we, as we continue to prevent one. Um, deploying those uncrewed assets in ways that help us to understand um, the Indo-Pacific environment better, to work more closely with allies and partners on the day-to-day -day concerns that they have, whether it's to do with um, illicit fishing, whether it's to do with coercion in the surrounding seas. Um, 
we can use all of those technologies to aid in those endeavors, but also to learn a bit about China and how it operates and what it is sensitive to and how we then can further deter them from taking those kinds of actions um, that that we would prefer that they not. Yeah, and and for your information, of course, South Korea has really fantastic shipyards <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for possible future maintenance of your warships. Dr. Kim. Okay, in my understanding, the, in terms of uh, naval power between the U.S. and China, uh, statistic, statistically, the gap has been reduced. But the problem is that from the China's perspective, uh, and also probably the U.S. government also understands, that the problem is not the number of warships, but uh, now the Chinese government more focusing on uh, commanding and operating system of the naval uh, operations. Uh, for that reason, the China, for example, the Chinese uh, people has a, a bad memory in the uh, their uh, modern history. For example, the Sino-Japan war in 1894 to 95. At that time, the Qing dynasty maintained uh, three times more warships than that of uh, Japan. But the result was the Japan defeat the Qing dynasty's uh, warships. Because of it is not only the number of warships, but also its commanding and operating systems. In that case, the Chinese government uh, made a huge effort to improve on these uh, conditions. And the Chinese government continuously invest and uh, to develop AI system to overcome the differences of operating and commanding system in uh, the, the China and US uh, naval power differences. OK, thank you. And I will turn my last question to Dr. Madan and Dr. Ma. And this is something actually um, brought up, a point brought up by Dr. Kim, and a very, very important um, point, which is domestic politics, right? It's all great that you know we have this trilateral alliance, but you, you all know that we have a very, very, very important general election coming up in April uh, next year. If the ruling party, PPP, wins, then I think it will put wings on the Yoon suk yeol government, and he will consolidate even further this trilateral approaches that we're taking. But um, if the PPP loses, remains a minority, lame duck will come uh, very shortly, and, and the opposition party will grab at the ankle in everything that the, that the ruling party and the, and the government does. Oh, and then, of course, we have the U.S. presidential election as well. Um, and, you know, here in the Pacific, you know, in Asia, we hear about the return of um, your possible return of your former um, President Trump and a lot of dynamics being played out in the U.S. Uh, as well. Um, so can you tell us, you know, what the implications might be, the domestic pol political implications for what we're trying to build I mean, we like to, you know, as your the, the the speaker, I forgot the the Dr. Sullivan was it? Yeah, talked about the next seventy years, right? Um, I mean, that would be fantastic, but politics is just too volatile, especially in in Korea. So, can you just give us some, you know, thoughts on how this plays out? I mean, I think one of the things it could do is, you know, there's always the potential that it paralyzes us, that this is not going to work, so why try it anyway? I think we should let these domestic political uh, concerns incentivize us to try to actually build these, uh, this, these kinds of cooperation, these mechanisms, uh, and consolidate them, prove that they have value. Because even with publics, you have to show that something is sustainable and effective for their interests. Um, and I think we often need to do a better job of explaining why does that you know, trilateral translate into uh, more effective um, lives or better, uh, how it's going to change somebody's lives on, life on the ground. So you have to, I think, um, I think uh, you know, politics can always, you can always say, let's not start 
doing something because we'll have to stop it. I think the other thing, though, is it proves the point of this distributed network. Because even if you want to make sure there's redundancy built in, uh, you want to actually have the kind of you know, cooperation, uh, whether it's kind of Australia, uh, Korea, Indonesia, whether that's Australia, Korea, so that even if one thing, one leg isn't working or not as strong, that there are other uh, kind of um, mechanisms. I think finally, one way of showing that alliances and partners, for example, in the US matter, is to make the point that our partners and allies in the region are burden sharing including in terms of resources uh, and willingness. And so that I think, uh, and is another reason for me, the domestic political constraints, and I understand all the uncertainties that creates, but that that should actually incentivize us uh, to do more in terms of this distributed network. Okay, Dr. Mao, final words? Yes, it's a very critical and very difficult question. Uh, when it comes to the question of, uh, you know, our uh, next general election uh, in April next year, I think uh, we need to uh, bring uh, more deliverables, which is more tangible and visible to our public. Uh, you know, Korea, Japan uh, has suffered a lot uh, uh, in its relationship. And uh, the cost of uh, the, the bad relationship is actually... Uh, in the economic cost, it was you know you know uh, translated into economic relations too. So how can Korea Japan uh, coordination and cooperation and and expand it uh, further can really bring more economic benefits to our own people? I think it's really important. Uh, you know, deliverables should be you know much more visible and tangible. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ma. Korea's previous government under Moon Jae-in talked about Ammi Kyung Jung, which is when it comes to security, it's the U.S., but economics, it's China. The current Yoon suk yeol government is about Ammi Kyung Se. Security, the U.S., economics, the world, towards the world. It's, um, the current government is very strongly committed uh, to the U.S. ROC alliance and trying to institutionalize the trilateral link uh, between the U.S., South Korea, and, and Japan uh, as never uh, done before uh, in a way. So I, I really hope that you know, intellectuals like yourselves uh, help out uh, so that there will be a very strong root in the institutionalization of the trilateral relations so that it can withstand even whatever political whims there may be in both countries. And for that, I thank uh, the organizers for such a wonderful conference, and I hope it contributes to, towards that kind of a cause and the, and the end. And um, we're over time, so thank you for wonderful panelists, and thank you for, for the conference. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>